At the center of the universe, at the border between the light and the dark, stands Castle Grayskull. For countless ages, the heroes of Grayskull have defended the universe against the forces of evil. Walk through the Hall of Living Pictures and learn the history and mystery of the masters of the universe. Dive deep into the mythology of Eternia, Etheria, and more. For those who know the stories of Grayskull will come the power. The power to be supreme. The power to be all-knowing. The power to be... Legends of Grayskull. And welcome to episode 42 of Legends of Grayskull, the fan podcast where we discuss the history, the mystery, the magic, and mythology of He-Man, She-Ra, Eternia, Etheria, Nordor, Primus, New Adventures, Old Adventures, UK Annuals, Golden Book, Lady <laughs> Bird, anything and everything you can think of with that He-Man, She-Ra, Masters of the Universe, Princess of Power, that Mattel logo down there at the bottom. <laughs> I'm Matthew Dooch. I'm here today with Sean Skavarna. Sean, how are we doing today? I'm pretty good. I love that carnival barker part every dang time. I swear. It's like, no matter how much I'm like, I should just sit still through this. No, you get my head bopping every dang episode. And I got <laughs> Lady Bird this right this time, so year. it's a good day. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, no, the other day it was Golden Books. You said something. Maybe it was Golden I forget Bird. what it was. I mixed Golden Bird with lost... Lady Books. Something like that. Yeah, it was Golden Bird when, when we did our last <laughs> episode the other day. Yeah, and I, I, I was like, wait a minute. So, <laughs> once again here, it is All-Star September. This is our third episode, and we are joined today by a wonderful member of the community, both as a fan and as a professional. He, he is the keeper of knowledge, uh, the holder of cells, the animation expert. He <laughs> literally wrote the book on Filmation. It's my book. <laughs> Officially and true. unofficially. And uh, an amazing guy all around, uh, animator, writer, illustrator, anything and everything you can think of. He has done it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Busta Tunes himself. James Etock is with us today. James, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. I, haven't, I don't hear the Busta Tunes thing much anymore, to be honest. Yeah. So that was... Uh, it's, it's quite a weird thing to hear. That's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> As my moniker for um, God, how many years was that? Like about three years until this was on the old mailing list days. Until yeah. I accidentally typed in the in, in a reply um, piece from James, and uh, someone goes James, and I was like, oh, yeah. I've uh, ruined the illusion. Yes. <laughs> at, at, at that point, no, nobody was really. Well, I suppose a few people still use their monikers, but um, yeah, I, I was just so I wanted to remain quite anonymous and then eventually i was like yeah i think i should just put my name out there and that was it i, um, rem I remember yeah, the then, first time i heard about it james etock i'm like oh james etock he doesn't know any been anything about filmation what's he talking about <laughs> who's he think he is busted tunes you know it's that's uh, right yeah. this is a, a pretender to the crown yeah <laughs> no and that was the thing back in back in the late 90s uh everybody hid their it, it was all usernames all across the internet no one was putting oh, yeah, their yeah. stuff out there and uh, I know we'll get into it more in a minute here after the news, but I, I do want to just say thank you to you personally. Uh, you and Zadok Angel, the very first He-Man site I found was the episode review site, and that that helped stoke a passion that had... I'd basically just been watching VHSs and, you know, admiring my old toys at that point. And you guys just opened my eyes to the whole world of episodes that I had missed because I'd never got He-Man on TV. I only had the VHS releases. That was the extent of my knowledge of He-Man at that point. And, oh, and wow. then to find out, you know, I find the website, the review site late nineties and all of a sudden it's like problem with power and sweet bees home and just all this stuff. And I'm just like, mind blown you know so <laughs> it it was huge back in the day 
No, it was it was good, t- fun times, man. Lots of the the the, the, the never ending kind of journey of discovery it was because we just didn't know as much about the cartoon back then. So it was like, wow, you know everything. I mean, you to this day we still discover stuff. Like, I think it was about three or four months ago, Dusan, um, my partner in crime from like the Return of Faker, uh, Dusan messaged me. And he's like, oh, we missed an auction. I was like, what was the auction? And it was for all this filmation art, like development artwork. It's like, ah. Oh. But the, the most amazing part of this development artwork, aside from a few different character versions, was there was a female Granomir. It was like, what? Yeah. It was like, what? Yeah, exactly. We were like, what? Um, I, it, was, it was probably done for fun, but um, it's it was a sketch of Granomir next to a female Granomir. And we could just make out by zooming in on the image and the text. And I think Granomir is saying like, yeah, shake it, baby, or something like that. It's really, it's, it's it's really surreal. But like that's what I mean. Is is you know this is this was 2020, yeah. and all this artwork was done in 1983, 84, and 85. And it's like, wow, how are we still discovering new stuff? So yeah, but sadly we didn't get our hands on um, that artwork. So right. that goodness knows what that is. But maybe one day it'll cross our paths again. But I'm yeah, open. if anyone else, sorry, you you, you want to. Yeah, if anyone... I was going to say, you want to do the news, and I'm kind of getting in the I way. know, it's, it's always tough here, with, especially with having a guest on, but I will I will put a plea out there right now. If anyone's listening to this, and they have that drawing of the female Grand Mirror, just scan it. Scan it, put it up there. Share, share yeah, the just, wealth here. Give it to just us. Give it to us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Shake it, baby. Shake Come it, on. Baby. That had to, there was some... Uh, well, I think in the book here, or, or on your page, didn't you share some other sort of jokey artwork that the artists used to do? Um... Yeah, there was there was the... the, the um, oh, Barry Cordwell was one of the storyboard artists. He did the He-Man credit card uh, moral yeah, segment. Yeah, that's... Uh, where yeah. it's like... Yeah, so that was one of my favorite ones where it's like He-Man holding it. It's like never leave home without it. And it was like a <laughs> He-Man MasterCard or something. It was something silly yeah. like that. But it was it was a really fun little thing. And they, they talked about how it got very close to production before someone was like, hang on a second, this is this can't we can't do this. You know? Right. But yeah, it was I love the idea of it coming that close to being produced. <laughs> yeah, that and, and wasn't there a storyboard where uh where like instead of uh storyboarding the uh, transformation sequence, they put like kids like jumping up and down on a on the chair yeah that that was one of my favorite ones that was don manuel he did he was doing um the price of freedom and it was, it was the stock footage of he-man yeah adam transforming into he-man so he did the, he illustrated those panels but in one of the panels just for fun he had a bunch of kids sitting around a telly watching it all going like oh my god here it comes and the tv was exploding there was like a little kind of i don't know despondent orco kind of stood to the back and it was it was a great image though because it kind of summed up what they really didn't know at the time was, I mean, they knew that He-Man was big, right. but to think that that sequence became so iconic, and yet this guy was illustrating this, kind of knowing that, it's like, yeah, this is a pretty important thing we've created. And then to think what it is now, it's almost like the defining moment from that series. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, you put, you show anybody the transformation sequence, regardless of what they knew or know now, they, they cue right in, they know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. All right. So let's jump over here. Let's get the segments rolling here. No, no, under, under, no, around. Oh, boy. Oh, dearie, my. Oh, we must work on these landings. I agree. Madam Raz, are you all right? Oh, dearie, my, yes. But there was something important I had to tell you. Now, what was that again? The news, madam. The news. It's time for the news. All right, it's time for the news. So first up, uh, the big news that leaked out of a German retailer. And my apologies, I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was. Uh, but the Origins Castle Grayskull has seemingly been leaked. Throw that up there right quick. So, we got a very, uh, for our audio listeners, we've got a very vintage, reminiscent uh, Castle Grayskull here. Uh, looks like the interior is just, the, you know, the reverse of the, the, the exterior. Uh Two panels, one with the throne, one or two platforms, I should say. One with the throne, one with the computer. Uh, and then up top, we've got three platforms. One for the gun, 
one for the where the flag would normally sit, where they put the trainer up there in this picture, and then an extra one on the back side that's holding the flag at the moment. Uh, so we got, and then we got the working elevator, a ladder, a weapons rack, and something else behind the ladder that nobody can seem to agree on what it is, right where the dungeon grate should be. Uh, so, gentlemen, what what are your thoughts here seeing this interior of the new Castle Grayskull? Take it away, anyone. Sure. Oh, the, it, guess first, James. Feel oh, free. um, I'm not really like, it's probably the, uh, heresy to say this, but I, I'm not the biggest uh, fan of the Origins line. Um, it's just one of those things that sort of like come along and I'm like, yeah, kind of, you know, is what it is. And I'm, I'm happy that people are really digging it and, you know, buying it en masse and stuff. And you want nothing but success for the brand because right. obviously that continues to build momentum for other things like a movie, ha, 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 but, you know, <laughs> various other things. Well, you know, um, you just think just because I, I'm not a fan of it doesn't mean, right. you know, other people uh, uh, also can't be fans of it. But, yeah, I mean, it looks, it looks obviously, with the Origins line, it's, it's a very retro look. So the castle looks like a very retro castle. When you compare this, obviously, to the um, the Castle Grace from Classics, which, if I remember rightly, was ridiculous as in the amount of detail oh, in yes. there and you know everything about it it was it was phenomenal but obviously this is i'm, I'm going to guess retail for much less than i can't imagine this is going to be a hundred dollars it'd probably be i don't know 50 they, or 60 i guess they said about um, uh i think it's retail for 90 uh in germany which translated to about 70 in the u.s i'm not sure what the exchange all right is anyway, okay but mm. yeah right in that right in yeah. that sweet spot the, the only other thing I would say is I don't believe in anything about... I, I don't believe in the term leaked image <laughs> because it's, uh, I, th I think it's a very purposeful thing. Someone, you know, I, I don't believe a retailer would take the chance of running foul of Mattel and going, hey, look what we've got, um, German website or whatever. Um, so it's probably like they get the image and it's like, yeah, you can put it out. You know, ideally we want you to put it out on this day, but you can you can promote it now. It's, it's a good way to create hype anyway. Absolutely. And it's worked because yeah. people are like, holy shit, it's a Castle Grayskull. So, um, yeah, good, good, you know, it looks, it looks, I love the throne. The throne should always look like that, if, if you ask me. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love a, a filmation Castle Grayskull throne, but this is obviously harking back to the uh, original Castle Grayskull. But, yeah, looks uh, looks badass. Sean? Well, um, I think the first thing that I thought of when I saw this is looking at the scale of the sorceress standing there. My heart kind of sunk for, well, I guess you can't really work with this too well with classics. No. Because that scale, you're going to have He-Man bumping his head into that uh, <laughs> level on top there. And for me, um, like uh, the weapons rack is, it's almost like a weapons rack light because it is a, it's not as wide as the original and some of that. I do like that they stuck with some of the brown tones mm -hmm. for it versus like the original, like the beige they used on some of the things, like the ladder, for instance. But yeah, like I, I was waiting to see whether or not this was going to be the centerpiece for me to have as, okay, I didn't get in on the classics because I wasn't in the line when classics right. Grayskull hit, and now it's a mortgage payment to get one of those. <laughs> and it looks like I'll just be saving up my pennies for that Classics one, because for the dollar amount that you're talking about, this seems like a really, you know, it's a decent deal. Like, there's some nice additions to it. The computer, for instance, behind Sorceress, I like that that looks like it's going to be a plastic 3D piece and all that, instead of a cardboard right. cutout like the original, but uh yeah i mean this is so much like the vintage that i already have two of those in my basement right now I oh wow <laughs> yeah uh, and the one is just here's the shell so i can display the you know the exterior and have he-man and battle cat and skeletor and panthor in front but it's like i already got that so i'm gonna just wait for the classics one either to either go down in price which <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah not gonna happen or <laughs> Or uh, just, you know, save up the money, obviously. So, uh, but it, it is a cool hearkening back to the retro feel like the line is supposed to be. And uh, one one quick thing, James, I'm really happy to hear your opinion as well, because we seem to be the contrarians out there yes. right now, too. And it's nice to know that you as well are like, it's nice that this is out there, but it's not doing it for you the same way. Like, we look at it and we're like, it's great the brand is still out there. It's thriving. People are really going for it but we're, we aren't going for it quite the same way as other fans as well. So don't feel bad right. if 
on our show in particular. <laughs> don't feel bad. We we're happy the brand is alive, but yes. we're more classics guys or vintage guys in that way too. So it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm in good company. Yeah, we we yes, you are in good company here. <laughs> we like to cover it because we know a lot of fans are are talking about it. And honestly, I'm more hyped about it than I was, especially seeing how my kids have reacted to it. Um, but that being said, this castle is very, very under underwhelming to me. I think you guys hit all the positive points, so I'll, I'll just say any positive points they had, I agree with. Uh, a couple things I wanted to point out are, are it's the awkward things. It's number one, it looks to be very uh, shallow, uh, very like the 2000X castle was. Because if you look at that elevator, that platform extends way out uh, from the actual yeah. floor of the castle. And I, I don't know if there's, if there's going to be a floor piece. I hope there is, like kind of how the classics did to join the two sides. Because if you look down at the bottom there, there's a gap between the actual floor and the floor of the castle. So I'm hoping they have like a slide-in floor piece to go there. Otherwise, it just looks kind of awkward. Uh, the jawbridge being mo molded in brown, I hope, is a placeholder because that looks really weird on the inside with the brown tongue and teeth. Um, and honestly, I'm, I'm going to take a weird point here. I, I think we can all safely assume it's going to come with the Temple of Darkness, the white-colored sorceress, right? Because she's shown here. And I can't believe they would release that as the retail version. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I'm kind of sick of getting figures with vehicles and play sets. Can't we just do a, a cheaper price point and do just a castle or just a, a vehicle by itself anymore? I mean, that's... Mm. I'm going to take this off now. I suppose it's the hook, isn't it? It's, it's the... Uh, yeah. it's de no, I don't want to say the, the trick, but it is that thing of... Hey, you want the sorceress? Guess what? She's you can only get her in Castle Grayskull. So let's say out of a hundred fans, you get ten fans who really want the sorceress figure. And they're like, oh, I'm gonna have to get Castle Grayskull then. Okay, I'll right. do that. So I'll get the castle and I'll have the sorceress figure. And then two years from now, Mattel will release the right. figure on itself, and then you're like, yeah. oh, you know. Yeah. But that's that's the way it is. It's not necessarily them being evil. It's just hey, we're a business. Yeah. That's what yeah. people seem to forget about Mattel. They are a business. Right. They're, yeah. they're not. They're not in this to the, making fans happy. Isn't the top priority? Oh, it's making money. Yeah. It's it's sorry sorry yeah the other way around yeah making money making fans happy. That's yeah. the way all businesses are. That's the way every successful business should absolutely. run. You know, I've had I've had I've had issues with eBay lately, and I'm like eBay. I've been with you for 23 <laughs> years, and now you want me to now you want me to declare myself as a business. But it's right. like they're not. They don't give a crap that i've been with them for 23 no. years they they want more money out of me it's simple as that it's like yeah that's why you are ebay that's why you are the go-to and everybody knows Absolutely. you, you know? mm -hmm. it's just yeah i just it's funny yeah it's up. just more just i mean and it's bugged me since classics like we couldn't we couldn't just get a battle ram we just we couldn't just get a rotan you know we had to, we couldn't just get point dread and the talon fighter you had to get a tila a skelcon a man at arms with it and you know I don't know. I just, you know, same with the Sky Sled that they've released for Origins. They had to put Prince Adam in there. When you when you know, it, you know, any fan that stops and thinks knows that you're going to get, you know, well, maybe not the Skelcon, obviously, and the Man Arms was a variant, but right now, like, you're going to get a Sorceress in the line single carded. You're going to get a Prince Adam single carded. Prince Adam, you know, yeah, of in course. the maroon vest, probably. And, and, you know, it's, I don't know, it's neat that they include the variants, but then at the same time, at some point, it'd just be kind of nice once in a while just to release, you know, just the vehicle or something like that. Because looking back at it, like, we didn't need, as kids, we didn't need that hook to go, oh, you know, I'd really like to get Land Shark, but I really wish it had a Skeletor with it, you know? Um, it was cool when it did. This is the problem, though. It's a very different time. Yeah. But, yeah, I think the problem is it, it's not, you know, whatever Mattel wanted to kind of kid themselves, this toy line is not aimed at kids. It's simple as that. People, people will say, "Hey, look at look at my kid playing with the toy," and it's like, "That's great," but you do realize that the other ten customers that took all those skeletons off the peg were collectors, right. adult collectors, and it's the same with, you know, I, I see it on Instagram, on social media, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, of people going, "Look, I've got my skeleton mint on card and my skeleton, uh, you know, loose," yeah. and that's not nothing wrong with that. Right. That's fine, but 
if if Mattel are trying to say this is a line for kids and to get that, uh, you know, children into the line, it's never going to work because you, you've got the the adult collectors and adult people, uh, adults who um, sell toys for a living, who will go into a, uh, I was going to say Toys yeah, R Us into a Kmart and just just get all the get all the skeletons off the peg, get all, grab all those skeletons, put them in a thing, and then sell right. them on eBay internationally. It's it's yep. It's not. It's not going to appeal to kids. And also, dare I say, you know, the reason it worked in the eighties was because after a year, you did have all that media that came with it, like the cartoon, the books, this, that, and the other. And with this, there's nothing really. In, like in fairness, you can actually what what Mattel should have done, or however they could have worked this, is promote like the cartoon series. If it was, it's not on Netflix in the UK anymore. Right. But if they, if it was on Netflix, they could say, hey. You know, play or even on the packaging. Like, watch the filmation, watch the, watch the yeah. cartoon series as a way of maybe getting kids to go. Oh, there's a like, there's a cartoon. Can we watch the cartoon? And then you know, th- then you're doing something different. But at the moment, kids are probably going, "Oh, I like this," and the dad's like, "Yeah, let me play with it now." You know, let me put it on my shelf. And it's just like, <laughs> oh no. So it's it's it, it, like obviously this is what that CGI series is going to be. Um, hopefully. Yeah is more appealing to kids but from what i understand it's going to be very different <laughs> like very very different so cool. um yeah it, it could also be like my son i got him skeletor he-man a battle cat for his birthday and that was just two weeks ago he hasn't gone back to those figures like i was thinking he would but what he did do is yeah that's and that's the interesting thing is as as a collector i you know Rightly or wrongly, there is no right or wrong answer. But I've always let my kids play with my figures. I've let my daughter, since she was young, pull the classics down off the shelf and play with them. My classics, Castle Grayskull, is in my son's room right now. Um, because he, he, he knows that it's Dad's, and that if he messes it up, mm-hmm. I will be furious. And he takes very good care of it <laughs> and makes sure everything's put away back where it goes when he's done with it and, and locks it back up and everything. He takes great pride in it, actually. and uh, But he knows that if I want to play with this, I have to take care of it. And I've never had a problem <laughs> pulling the class. You know, he'll see a classics that I w- had displayed back when I had room to display them. And, he, you know, can I play with this? Yeah, sure. Just, you know, it doesn't go in with your other stuff. Take care of it. And so, you know, my boys right now, they're eating up the origins, what little I've been able to find. Because, like you said, James, it's the collectors are buying up a lot of them, and uh, Mattel, Mattel yeah. honestly isn't doing a good job of keeping it out there. You know, uh, they're they're just they're not they're either it's like feast or famine from what I've seen around the country. Either either a Walmart like has a ton of them and they keep getting them, or like mine, they reset those pegs, and not a single figure has ever gone through that store. So. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's and that's that's on Walmart, honestly. You know, the Mattel made the agreements. Walmart pulls its usual stuff where it doesn't uphold its side of the agreements and distribution, and they don't care because it's not like you're gonna pull your stuff out of a Walmart. You know, uh, yeah. But I think it'll get better after the first of the year when it'll be available at all retailers, and uh, I look forward to getting more of them for my kids. Uh, I might get a scare glow for myself because I have no scare glows, and that uh, that's that's the one where I'm like, okay, he looks pretty cool, and I'm always a sucker for glow in the dark and translucent stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, he's he's the one that I'm willing to get for myself because I missed him in the vintage line, but I have him in the classic line. So it's like, all right, you know, bridge bridge that gap a little bit by having <laughs> this guy that looks similar but not quite you know and that, from the vintage yeah. absolutely all right so that's the origins castle gray school uh i think and I, I feel pretty confident saying that this is legit uh, i know there was a, a list leaked what was it last earlier in the year out of germany that was like completely blown out of the water by now uh what would the power con reveals but this one it looks it, it, it's different enough from vintage and the classics Castle Grayskull that I think this has to be legit, or someone is amazing at their Photoshop. So, uh, yeah, I, I 
the the last thing I want to say is I'm curious to see what the front of it's going to look like because the interior to me is like, all right, that's all well and good, but is it going to look iconic like the vintage? Is it going to look like classics on the front? Is it going to look yeah. like something completely new that they're going to throw at us? Because that He-Man face is obviously not what we grew <laughs> up with either. Yes. So, and, and on top of that, Skeletor with the open mouth, it's like, <laughs> all right, so what are you going to pull on this here? You know I mean? That's that's I think that's my biggest question after seeing that photo. Well, yeah, you make you make a really good point because the um, I remember being I was never a big collector of the two thousand and two toy line, but that Castle Grace, I remember right, it was. I mean, obviously it had its own unique Very design much. in terms yeah. of the car, the front, but I'm, if I remember rightly, it was just pretty much bland plastic, yeah. like green plastic. I'd have to mm -hmm. look it up again, but I seem to remember. There wasn't that, you know, the beautiful, and yet, as we found out in recent years, how they did the original Castle Grey School was just like literally just yeah. spray paint the <laughs> the things on the production line. As Paul yeah. Cleveland told, that's a wonderful story. Just like we just went in there and doing that. So yeah. technically, everyone is a variant. Is. You know, you just do yeah. that. There's a whole website out um, there the that's got like all the variant Castle Grey Schools, like all the different sprays, oh, from big eyes, little eyes. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's insane. <laughs> I, I just like on the uh, on the one documentary, I don't care if you do Zorro. And it's like, I want to find that version. The, <laughs> That's the right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a funny guy. Paul Cleveland. But yeah, the, um, the 2002 one, it just, I remember just being, it was just that right. green plastic and it just looked, bland but i mean it had the added what sound chip thing in so I was like, that's pretty cool but mm -hmm. yeah I, I was never a big fan of that i mean i'd like the designs i love the mm -hmm. cartoon but yeah i wasn't a big collector at that point and then classics happened and i was like oh that's it this is the best he-man toy line ever exactly you know? yeah exactly <laughs> that's our mantra here so far <laughs> it's yeah it's, it's ridiculous that, 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 that classics line had no right to be that good and it was um yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal toy line because it, it just ticked every box you ever wanted. Yeah, it's like, hey, remember that thing you wanted back in the day? It's like, yeah, yeah, I do. Here it is. You're like, oh <laughs> no, that's amazing. Yeah, well, so, one of the one of the absolute greatest things in classics for me was just you had a full power sword for both He Man and Skeletor, which as a kid that was huge. That was like probably top two of things that I wanted resolved in those figures. I just wanted him. Both of them to have, here's a full sword for both of them instead of putting them together yeah. and all that. Yeah. So the minute that's like, okay, here's a full, here's a half, it's like my heart all of a sudden like palpitations. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, this is exactly what I'm waiting for. So it was, it was it's, such it's... a joy to have that and then everything else they threw at us on top of all that. So. Exactly. That was an incredible toy, man. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, so real quick before we move on, I do want to start... Remind our viewers, if you haven't pre-ordered yet, please go pre-order the PowerCon uh, Dark Horse Book Bundle. It comes with the Toys of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and the uh, Character Supplement Guide. So, if you haven't checked that out, I'll put the link down below again. Uh, please go help support all those wonderful fans who worked very, very hard on both of those books. So, James... Obviously, you've been a lifelong fan. Uh, you need no introduction for most of us, but go ahead and do it anyways. Uh, every time we get a new guest on this show, God. just kind of the quick, you know, your your early uh, entry into the Masters of the Universe, and then did you stick with it? Did you fall out? And what brought you back? You know, just kind of like. Oh my goodness! Um, I, I, I don't do I don't do short. I'll try. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so uh, I, I say short, think? but um, the first time we did this with Yuka, I think we went on for like 45 minutes. So, I mean, short's relative. <laughs> Sounds about right. Um, yeah, I'll uh, let me think. Um, so, yeah, obviously got the toy. Uh, I mean, it was quite funny. Up until about a, a few years back, I wasn't sure which I discovered first, whether it was the toy line or the cartoon, just because it was quite a long time ago. And then there was a photo. My, my dad was quite a meticulous um, uh like in the photo albums he would list the year and the month of when he took like family holidays and stuff and there was a photo of me with a he-man figure and it was it was like march 83 and i was like wait a second that's like five months or four months before the cartoon debuts i was like yes i did discover the toy line prior to the cartoon and i've got vague recollections of it but um yeah i just uh I, I still remember to this day sitting down watching. There was like a week before they did. They ran a promo for it, and I, st I still to this day it's so weird that one of my most distinct young memories is seeing this promo and the the shots from Diamond Ray of Disappearance they used. I can still remember them clearly. It's so weird to think. I said, like, "Oh yeah, I remember 
watching that promo and it was like He-Man next week, 4.20 on Monday. And then, yeah, I sat down that following Monday and, uh, yeah, fell in love with this cartoon. I was just like, okay. And it was so funny in the UK because obviously they showed one episode a week, but they would break it up. So we had four four episodes in 1983. Then October, November, no, November, December go by. And then January, I think February, they started up more episodes again. So they would take these huge yeah. breaks. You would <laughs> never know. You'd, you'd, you'd start, you'd, you'd put on the TV and think, I'm going to watch He-Man. And then it was either like... The awesome Incredible Hulk 1982 series or uh, Spider Woman or what other shows? Yeah, various so, other shows. And I remember just being, as much as I like them, I'd be disappointed because I was like, So you man? wouldn't even have, like, <laughs> even if there wasn't a new episode, you didn't get reruns either? It was a completely different show in that time slot? Oh, no, no, no. We, we so, like, to, to put it in simple terms, it was one episode a week on a Monday, yeah. but they would break it up. So it was, yeah, we, we wouldn't. You know, I've, I've said to people, our first episode, we got this, as, as I've touted many times, we got the show before right. anywhere in the world. It was like September the 5th, 80, 1983. However, we were still getting new episodes of He-Man in 1988. Yeah. That's three years after the show, the show had ended because they were still doing this one once a week and, you know, take a month or a year break and then show a new bunch of episodes. But one of the... One of the um, just yeah, the, the, these breaks were just—it was so strange because you just thought, "What's going on?" And then Shiva was introduced, and then Shiva went from, I think eighty—I want to say eighty-five to about nineteen ninety, which is really weird when you think about it. And the first, the first time we got reruns was in eighty-seven. So that that tells you, and we these shows only broadcast on UK TV twice ever. So it was like the original run and then reruns. That was it. There was never any, you know. Other, it was on. It was on te- um, satellite, but in the UK, you didn't have satellite. Nobody really got satellite or cable until the mid mid nineties, really. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and uh, so with the cartoon, yeah, I discovered the cartoon, got all the figures, and then obviously other shows came along, um, and then you you fall into love with those. So I think it was like, <clears throat> for me, it was He Man, uh, and then Transformers. And then Mask, and then Real Ghostbusters, and then my last one was kind of Ninja Turtles. Absolutely. Ninja Turtles was sort of like where I bought. I remember buying the Ninja Turtles toys and thinking, awesome. And then I was, I remember trying to play with them and going, this feels really weird. It, I remember that was the moment where I was like, I don't think I, I'm enjoying playing with toys anymore. So that was that was when I stopped playing with toys. Really, it was. Um, I think I was probably about 13 or something. I had these Ninja Turtles figures. I was like, nah, you know, it just wasn't. I wasn't feeling it. But um, yeah, and then eventually, I remember I still had bunches of He-Man episodes on a VHS tape, like seventy-two episodes. I always remember that. I'd like wow. a bunch of VHS tapes. Yeah, just, I, which was amazing. But bear in mind as well, we didn't know how many episodes there were. So I was like, "Well, I've got seventy-two, and I'd written down the titles. And there was a few episodes where I missed the title card, so I made up names <laughs> of them. There was the shadow. There was one that called the Shadow of Skeletor, yeah. which I didn't know what the title was, so I called it <laughs> called it what? <laughs> just remembering this. I called it War on Two Moons. <laughs> it's just not as, uh, not as impressive. No, it's, good. it's a good but, effort, um, though. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was all right. Um, so, yeah, I remember uh, I had all those on tape, but I didn't, I didn't watch He-Man anymore. You know, I, I still had an appreciation for animation, but I, I was... And then I became a teenager. Then I discovered... Man, well, not, I just was into other things. I was big into hip-hop music at the time, and... So the first thing I searched for, this is prior to Google and Lycos, so God knows what the search engine was. The first thing I searched for was this hip-hop group called Souls of Mischief, who were this underground uh, hip-hop group from East Oakland, California. I searched them, and amazingly, they had a website, and there was lyrics and merchandise on there. I've still got one of their shirts, and WAV files of their unreleased music, and it was, yeah, really fascinating to be like, well, this... Underground hip hop group have got a website, so it's not just for weirdos; it's for cool people with <laughs> dreads, you know. So yeah, I was, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can get into this. So um, the next thing I searched for was a, um, I searched for He Man. So I was like, I wonder if anybody else remembers this. And amazingly, I found one website where the guy whose name I forget, I think it was Kevin, no, Matthew, oh, where his name was, really sweet guy, and he'd, oh, Kevin Huber or Herber. Anyway, he'd listed just all the characters and he'd, he'd have like a character like Orko and then he'd talk about the toy and Zodak and talk about the toy. 
and it was just that and i was so impressed with this i was so fascinated by it i printed it out i was, I was reading it like night after night in bed just going oh my god someone else remembers this and then a few years a few years uh, like a few weeks after that the website that would become he-man.org started which was adam tyner's yep. he-man website i think the website was like c tyner anyway um i messaged him and i said oh i um I've, uh, you know, I can review episodes. I've got 72 episodes on tape. And he was like, oh, great. And whilst I was contributing reviews, other people were. And it's like, wow, there's some episodes that, you know, I've never seen or heard of. You know, I remember seeing the House of Shikoti ones. I was like, oh, my God, that's the one I remember as a kid being really scared by, the, the Shikoti episode. Um, and, yeah, I think a few months after that, I thought, let me try this website business. Because back then, as well, it was code. So you literally have to learn how to do HTML code. Okay. So I used Netscape Gold, I think it was, and I created this, um, what was it? I think it was just called Buster Tunes, he managed Shearer website. And it was pretty much just my brain to the page going, here's some of my favorite episodes, here's some screen captures. And back then, screen captures were oh, it's huge. all like to do. Yeah, it was just like, here we go, I've got to you know, take this image from a video capture card and plop it online. And it wasn't just, you know, nowadays it's like snapshot done. Yeah. Um, very different, very very different time. So um, yeah, and on, on this website as well, I had like episodes that I'd vaguely remembered as a kid. So I'd put descriptions up, and people started telling me what these episodes were. Um, so that was really good. I was like, oh wow, now I'm getting the episodes that I haven't seen in at that point like 12 years. Now I'm getting the titles for those. And then the mailing list came along, and that brought the community together more. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we we all started just going, oh my God, let's try and figure out how many episodes there were, because we just didn't know. And around the same time, I started speaking to the late, great Larry Dottilio. He was such a sweet guy and very forthcoming with correspondence. And I said, oh, I've got this, um, you know, I've been doing this website and I'm trying to figure out how many episodes. And he said, oh, there was two seasons of He-Man, 130 episodes each. And I said, how many of She-Ra? And he said, um, he, he only knew of one season. So he said, oh, one season of She-Ra of 65. And I was like, okay, cool. Did he leave? So, oh, yeah. so he left before the second season of she huh? I never, oh, yeah, I never yeah. realized Larry, that. Larry, yeah, Larry Dottilio's last episode is the last episode of season one. I think it's um, uh, The Greatest Magic, yeah. where uh, she goes to Troller. That's the last episode of season one. It's also Larry's last filmation thing. Then he went over to Deke okay. and did, um, I think, like, Real Ghostbusters. Well, no, he, did, he didn't do much Real Ghostbusters, but he worked... Oh, no, he worked with Tokyo Movie Shinsha, so he did... Um, uh, Galaxy High School and Barnick 6 for them. He did a lot of stuff for those shows. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, Larry was great. We found out. And then the mailing list, we all got together and just started tape trading. And it was really fun to kind of discover how many episodes were there works. We, just, you know, we, we now know there's a target, 130. We've got like, how many more to go? There's four. Like, what are they? And then one guy would come over and go, I've got this episode. And you're like, great. And then I've got this one. And then the last two were the once and future duke and troubles middle name it's like oh my god and i still remember in 90 august of 97 sitting down with a tape with these two episodes on and being like oh my god i vaguely remember these but now i'm going to watch them for the first time in again like 10 years at that point or maybe 12 but in watching it going yes we've now seen all the episodes we know there's 130 he-man and there's 65 she episodes then zadok comes to me and says hey do you want to do a he-man and Shira website i was like no he says um you know, we can review episodes. I, he took, it's so funny, the amount of convincing he did. He was like, you really, you know, you should do this. I was like, I don't want to. So we started this website, and I think about a year into it, or maybe a few months into it, he messaged me, and he was like, there's a girl online, or like, I don't think online was a term, there's a girl in the community yeah. saying that she's got 14 additional she episodes. It's like, what? There's 14 more? He's like, yeah, I was like, okay. So we got these, oh, she sent 14 episodes. It was like, right. right. And we got like, oh, there's more she -Ra. And then this guy called Owen Sharp, whose website is still up, came up. And he, he'd done a, um, some sort of university thing where he'd done a, I don't know if it's dissertation on He-Man, but he broke down every single He-Man and she episode. Yeah. So he listed like, he listed like 28 she episodes. Oh, actually, tell a lie. I'm going to have to do that story again. It starts the other way around, I think, is that, um, Weed Owen Sharp pops up and says, "Hey, there's these 14 additional episodes." You're like, "Oh my god, there's 14 more Shira episodes." And then Zadok says, "There's a girl called Stephanie who's got another 28 Shira episodes." Like, what? How many are there? So we right. discovered there was 28 episodes in Shira's second season, and watching those for the first time was ridiculous <laughs> because one, they were they none of them had moral segments. They were the worst quality possible, but yeah. you were just so desperate to see episodes at the time. It's like, "Oh my god." 
Um, and then a year after that, Robert Lamb got in touch and said, hey, I love what you said about um, uh, your reviews of Into the Abyss and Not So Blind. Um, we chatted a bit, and then he sent Zadok and I each a box, had a cover letter really beautifully written, and in that box was like this He-Man series Bible, um, storyboards, model sheets, um, un unproduced episodes that he'd kind of written, I think a few drafts, which was just like, oh my God, this is all fantastic stuff. Amazing. And then, um, then what happened after that? Yeah, then we started to put all that stuff online, like the He-Man series Bible, when we just became this hub where people would come to read the episodes. And a few years after that, it became this quite a big website. It was, it was He-Man.org and the episode review website. And people just, yeah, people loved it. Every Saturday we would update the website. And people would just, when you get an update, and it was so funny back then because you had such limited web space. You'd, yeah, I could only, we could only have four episodes up at a time. So every <laughs> Saturday, I would have to delete all the file, delete the entire website, and then re-upload it with the new images and webs, and and yeah. then take hours because it was just like you know 56k modem. Oh, absolutely. Oh boy, it was, it, it was crazy. But it was, you know, you got so used to it. Now you could do it. In a, you wouldn't even have to take anything down. But, um, yeah, and then that led to many years later, well, a few years later, Mattel got in touch and said, hey, we're doing this new cartoon, man, can I just want to help out and stuff? We did, or I did. And then, because they look at this point, went to Harvard, and he was like, website technically died. We had a massive falling out. So it was just like, eh, let's leave it. Let's let's forget about that. So we both walked away from it thinking that we're done. Um, that was actually when Mattel first got in touch and said, let's do, let's do this, uh, this encyclopedia for us. Um, then the MV Creation stuff happened. Then the DVD, the UK DVDs happened. Then the American DVD happened, yes. which led to uh, working on so many amazing stuff like He-Man DVDs. Then we did She-Ra, Dungeon Dragons, Flash Gordon, Defenders of the Earth, Brave Star. Um, yeah. Every filmation show. The Sun. We worked on all those things. It was so much fun to do those, and it paid stupidly well as well. Like to the point where I, had, I could. They say don't quit your day job, and I was like, I can quit my day job. So <laughs> it was great. I actually. I genuinely quit my day nice. job to work on these DVDs. <laughs> and then after that, what did I do after that? Um, we come up to the board. Like, so it's just, I, yeah, then the, the, like the Dark Horse stuff. Like, well, there's, I did some stuff on the classics, then yeah. Dark Horse, the Dark Horse books, then uh, the, the pop culture collectible statues, then Super 7 filmation classics. What did, what no, did you do on this? The Super 7 line. What did you do on the statues? That's one that doesn't get talked about much. Oh, I, I wrote the I wrote the bios on each of those. So the big statues, yeah. the like whatever they were, two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, ridiculous. Ones. I, I um, have none of them. I've... Oh, <laughs> oh, I yeah, yeah, I've got two, nice. but that's because I wrote the bios and I'm like, and I sh I should have asked for more, but I, I was like, I don't want a bunch of statues in my house, but I, was like, I should have got the evil in one. Oh, absolutely. But um, yeah, I, wrote, I, I basically I wrote the bios on each of those. Okay. They were a lot of fun to do. Nice. And then um. Yeah, and then after that, got the Super 7 work, which was... Super 7 were great. So much fun to work with. The best company I've ever worked with were Dark Horse. So they were just... When I did that um, cartoon guide, they were just... Oh, my God. Just so willing to... You know, even though they're the publishing yeah. company and the people designing the book, the first thing they sent me, I was just like, yeah. I don't like this. So I was just really honest. I said, look, I'm not sure about this. I said, here's my idea. And they were like... Uh, no, that was what I did. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds really cheeky, but I, 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 I've still got it to this day. I created like a PDF design guide. Yeah. And literally the first, uh, the first thing I said was, this is not an art book. Because the way they were doing it was like an art book again. It's like, look, I get you did the He-Man art, the art of He-Man, the last universe, but this is a guide. This is a textbook right. with a lot of images. Um, and they were just so willing. So the, the design that you see in that book is a, a merger of both of our ideas. And it came together so beautifully. And they were... They, yeah, I, I still get lovely emails from them to this day or messages on Facebook from the guys that worked on it. There you go, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great layout. That was, it was so much fun to do. And like, they, they, they come, we both contributed to that and it came together so nicely. But one of the, definitely one of the, the proudest things I worked on. And then, um, yeah, since then, what else has happened? Um, oh, I spent three and a half years doing the return of Faker. That was, um, for an that was a completely unofficial thing that, you know, never really went anywhere, but may do at some point in the future. I'm Who knows? I've, still, um, I've avoided every trailer. I've avoided everything that you, you put out while you were making it. And I'm, I'm waiting. I'm hopeful that the whole thing oh, is revealed. So it's those, that have, those that have seen yeah. it, like it's, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> the amount of, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you do stuff in life, you work on something, you're like, oh, I'm proud of that. With that, it's like, if you don't like this, 
then you you never enjoyed filmation yeah. as simple as that i can understand like if there's people that only liked the first four mini comics and were like i hate that filmation yeah. stuff that's fine if you remotely enjoyed the filmation cartoon people would love this because it takes itself seriously while also having that wry smile which is the perfect filmation episode not skeletor you know flying off on a rocket or screaming but skeletor <laughs> drag Dragon Invasion Skeletor, Diamond Ray Skeletor, Evil Lynn's Plot Skeletor, that Skeletor, the same Skeletor that I write for Mars Universe 84. Yeah. I'm, ri- I'm writing Skeletor. Alan Oppenheimer's voice is in my head as I'm doing it, but I'm like, avoid calling Beastman fur face, fur brain full, flea bitten full. I'll, you know, I love all that stuff, but it's, I want to keep Skeletor as he, right. as those, the, like Robbie London and Paul Dini and Michael Reeves and even Larry DeCilio. When those guys were writing those scripts initially, they were going, they were looking at the DC comics as well, going, okay, we want the guy, this is the guy we're writing yeah. about. And then eventually that, you know, you hear the voice and the writers are like, okay. I think we can kind of play this character for laughs. <laughs> so yeah, Return of Faker happened and now Master Universe 85 is the thing. So- okay, so yeah, let's, let's talk about Masters of Universe 85 for a minute here. So uh, for those of you who don't know, okay, yeah. this is an amazing unofficial free to view uh comic that james has been posting weekly on fridays on instagram and facebook uh it's an amazing series so far uh i know me and sean are both refreshing constantly every friday morning even though we know he waits until about five or six (laughs) his time but uh Yeah, (laughs) yeah, so uh, tell us about this amazing team you've assembled to help you bring this to fruition I'll just talk quickly about like why I came up with the idea. So after last year's PowerCon, we kind of a bunch of us, including myself, kind of got the impression that I don't think Mattel are going to be looking to the previous fan base for input anymore. There's nothing wrong with that. Like you know, when you look at these companies now, they've got people probably in their twenties and thirties. Why are they going to be hiring some forty-three-year-old who once? used to watch a cartoon back in the 80s who's an expert at it it's like i can understand why they're you know they're not looking for my input right. with regards to that stuff so it's like okay that's that's cool you, you've made that decision good luck to you um so i'm gonna uh, do my own thing and ever since like i'd say for about the last half a year i've just been constantly thinking to myself how i really want to celebrate he-man and shayra i kept thinking like what is the best way to do that like something that really transports right. me back to that feeling in the 1980s and there was a uh, there's a thing where and it happens to me so often whenever i'm walking through certain areas of london um the beautiful thing about london is you've got very specifically designed buildings of different eras so you can see victorian london you can see 1950s london you can see modern london you know within the space of a few blocks so when I'm walking through the 1950s designs, which were where a lot of my friends lived, you know, in terms of the 1980s, these kind of council flats and stuff, they're very um, almost brutalism in design. It's yeah. just very like square. But I've got a lot of memories of hanging around those places when I would go to my friend's house and he would, I would go around his house and uh, like different friends, you know, lived in different places. But those memories are always connected to like 1983 and four and five going to their houses and seeing their toys because you know as a kid you didn't get every toy and one of my friends he was like for instance he had evil lynn i remember like like oh wow you've got evil lynn even though she was available but it was like wow you've got an evil lynn toy that's so cool and he also had one of my favorite things from transformers he had tracks but he had the original red tracks which was a weird um what they would do um is for the uk they, like, even though Hasbro was distributing Transformers in the UK, there was a, I think Milton Bradley got the rights to, which is, a, a, I think Milton Bradley is, yeah, they're is that American board game company, I forget, yep. but they had the rights to just, yeah, board game company, but they had the ability, I think, I think it was Milton Bradley to distribute yeah. the toys over in England as well. But they were using, they would often put Diaclone, the original Transformers toys, in Transformers boxes. <laughs> so you'd get tracks, who's supposed to be blue, but you'd get the original red tracks, which right. is like ridiculous. And, um, my, my friend, a uh, few, another kid at school had Shockwave, so you'd always have that things like, oh my god, because those characters just weren't available in the UK. It was weird, um, but yeah, that those memories of being a kid and just being excited by seeing like a new mini comic, like what is this? And it's 
the secret liquid of life or something. So whenever I'm walking around these estates, like even to this day, I would always think to myself, how can I... I will always think of like Larry Houston mini comics or, you know, go around my friend's house and seeing these comics. And I always think to myself, how can I, how can I capture that, that love of He-Man and she And I kept thinking like, I could do a blog and I thought, no, I did a blog and that's kind of blogs of, nobody goes to blogs anymore. Websites are yeah. kind of a bit of a dying thing. So I thought, what can I do? And I, th- I thought about doing a YouTube channel. I thought, I don't, you know, that I'd probably be, flogging a dead horse for that <laughs> these days but obviously in recent weeks I thought to, my, I thought to myself I might actually do a YouTube channel now so I'm probably oh, going to do that but you should. I just kept thinking what can I do to, uh, yeah. I'm definitely going to do it but I um, I kept thinking what am I going to do and then um, yeah I just thought to myself why, why don't I just do a comic so I, I started coming up with ideas for it and I literally sat down and just started writing the first few pages of a script and I knew who I'd, I would use to colour it and, well, I say that, actually. I knew who I'd use to do the art. I knew Adam Moore was always like, so I've known Adam Moore for well over 10 years because he used to do stuff for Serial Geek. So I thought, oh, Adam would be amazing because I, I, everybody thought, and like the when I did the first press announcement, yeah. press release, when I did the first thing, people, people, 99% of people were really happy about it. And then someone shared in, I think it was the Savage... He Man mm. Facebook group, and they weren't so nice <laughs> about it. There was one guy who said, "I'm not, I'm not going to buy." Uh, no, sorry, he said, "I'm not going to like read a comic by Val and Scott's little friend." I was like, "Good start." And he said, um, wow. who, who, "Who who believes that the filmation episodes were written on God's parchment paper?" And I was like, "Hey there, you seem nice." Um, <laughs> Right. got laid lately you know it's just he was so angry and i was just like what the fuck so i thought but the, and the weird thing is in the back of my mind i'm thinking i, I don't mind yeah. that people dislike filmation but this guy was personally attacking me so it's like okay let's see what i can do about that um but my goal was always to do a filmation story but in the visual style of like the 1982 1983 82 right. mark tex era mini comics those those seven mini comics like um power of point dread uh the, the magic oh my God, um triclops oh, yep. yeah magic stealer that was what i was thinking i was like what's the, <laughs> the triangle the pyramid yeah. magic stealer yeah triclops one trap one tale of Teela, right. which is an incredible mini comic and those mini comics i i still they're still my favorite mini comics i love them i love them growing up and even though they're so very different from Filmation. Yeah. They just capture something so wonderful. Yes. Like Texera's art, it's, it's no Alcala, but Texera's art is so energetic yeah. and powerful. Yeah. And I thought, I just want to capture that that essence of um, like Skeletor being very dark and um, oh, devilish almost, um, whilst at the same time, you know, it's funny because Master of the Universe 85, I think there are a few people that think I'm doing a No Prince Adam story. And then in a few pages, they're going to turn the page and go, Oh, there's right. Prince Adam and Cringer. You know what I mean? Because it's, yeah, guess what? Been, They're in it because I'm doing the and filmation they've been in it story. Since before filmation. I know I keep harping on this, but Prince Adam and Cringer are not a filmation only thing like people like to put oh, no, they are now. You know, it's. <sighs> but the, the, the funny thing is, in those Mark Tex, Mark yeah. Tex era mini comics, Prince Adam existed in those. They just right. didn't use him because obviously the, the DC Limited series happened. You had the mm-hmm. He Man Superman, um, He Man mm-hmm. Superman 2 the three issues of the limited series and then the mini comics, because in the last issue of those, that limited series, it says, look out for the mini comics, which will come yeah. packaged with the thing in which we'll, we'll explain Taylor. And that was the beautiful thing about those. It was like, wow, now we're going to get these comics. Um, so yeah, Prince Adam and Cringer exists in those things. It's just, they just weren't uh, used. But um, yeah, so I just, I just wanted to tell this story of, um, like I said, I'm, I'm writing a filmation episode yeah. in my brain, yeah, like from top to bottom. It's like, that's a filmation episode. But, um, yeah, I just sat there, write, wrote it. And originally I had Doosan on colours. But, um, yeah, just we not didn't come to an agreement, but, like, Doosan took a stab at it. And I was like, okay, I can see what you're doing. And then Andrew Kramer, bless him, he's just, you know, he's a great colourist. I've known Andrew since, God, since before, I think, like, easily 2001, 2002, because he was on, he, he wasn't, I don't think he was on the main list, but he was in that yes, he, he meant all community when the, 2002 toy line kicked in and he was always like the artist guy but when i started doing serial gig i was like this yeah. guy can really color so i employed him to do so many much so much coloring 
And I remember I sent Andrew Kramer a page. I think it was the it was the first page of Adam Moore's art. And Andrew Kramer was just you know he's I, I love him for this. He just um, I sent it to him, and he came back and he goes, oh, I just coloured it for fun. And I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Like, mm-hmm. it was like, Doosan, don't worry, oh, Doosan can colour. Like, Doosan is an amazing colour. It's like, like what he did for Return of Fake. And also, he was, it's such a shame they didn't go with this, but he suggested colouring all the newspaper yeah. strips because he did some test ones, and they were amazing. His his test examples, I think you can find them online. I was just like, oh, they're beautiful. Um, so it's such a shame. But, yeah, yeah it was just something... I think Doosan was going for a more, uh, I would say, newspaper strip colouring, whereas Andrew Kramer was doing the Mark Tex era colouring, quite flat, but also with like highlights here and there. And I was like, yes, I want that. <laughs> so then I said, look, you know, I said to, I said to Doosan, I think I'm going to go with Kramer. And he's like, That's fair enough, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, it's not like Doosan and I haven't worked together for the last three and a half years on the return yeah. of Faker. So, um, yeah, I got Kramer on board. Kramer's doing the lettering as well. And it is like literally week by week. Yeah. As I talk to you now, there's no page. Eight. Page eight doesn't exist. So Adam Moore is illustrating page eight, and we've got to have page eight ready for Friday. So I should get it tomorrow morning. I'll give it to Kramer. Kramer will color and letter it, and then I'll put it up on Friday. So it's, it is working against the clock. But um, yeah, we, we, it's, it's coming together so nicely. And it's just I, you know, people get frustrated. Some people, not a lot, but like I wish it was here. Every, you know, I wish, it, I wish the whole thing oh, yeah. was here. And it's like yeah, I get that, but you know. We all, we all have lives, and this is just yeah. being done for free. But at the same time, it's like I also want it to be out there straight away because I know this first issue and the second issue are, yeah. are so much fun, especially like the way the second issue starts. People will just be like, oh, God, because you get the um, the sense of Desire as power uh, at the start of issue two. It's just like, oh, shit. And Desire, was, that was a beautiful thing because I just kept thinking, who should I make the baddie? And I thought I want it to be someone that – would fit into that world without going, you know, dare I say right. mighty spectre where it's like, Oh, clearly someone does, des- someone's designed him and right. inserted him into their, in, inserted their character into this world. So I thought, let me go back to, and I was going through the, the storyboards and I just thought to myself, why don't I use desire? Like people, I've whispered <laughs> desire on the winds over the years. It's like it was a character that, that legitimately right. was something that just never came to be. Gotcha. So I thought, I, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then it was just like what one then Mattel were like, here's Evil Lynn. And it was just like, right, all of Desira's dialogue, give to Evil Lynn. It was that simple. So I um I just thought, why don't I I will yes, Desira is very much Evil Lynn, but I could manipulate Desira's character to make her a different version of Evil Lynn. Like Evil Lynn is, you know, a mystic evil sorceress. So I thought, well, I can make Desira like the most powerful person on Eternia kind of thing. I could put her at that level where she's right. almost yeah, unstoppable. So um yeah, and then I went through all these different designs, and and Doosan had about a year, I think about a year or two ago, had gone through all the storyboard tests, showing Desire all these different Desirers, and he was just like, did all these designs, like brought all these designs to life in a filmation style. And I just went, I thought to myself, like, wow, Don Manuel's Desire with Doosan's yeah. colours looks amazing, but she had like this black, almost yeah. like Afro hair, and it just, it was, it was quite thick, and I just thought. If you look at her character and then look at Shakoti, who Don yeah. Manuel also designed, it was like there's the parallels were there. The crossover was so easy. So I thought I'll give her a defining feature, and I was just like I'll give her flaming That's head. It. <laughs> it just it seemed like such an obvious choice because I don't know. It just it, I thought I don't think that's been done in He Man yet. Yeah. So I thought yeah, I'll give her like her hair's on fire and make it blue, and it'll be like quite a unique thing the way adam moore has illustrated it from panel to panel it looks it really good gorgeous because it's just like it's it's like partly i think in the most recent page last week's page was it seven yeah yeah the way he has it going up the back of her head i was just like i didn't even think about how it looks from i just designed it like flaming head he's, he's done it so it's almost like right. where your hairline would be at the back of your neck going upwards i was like yeah that's beautiful that so yeah marcy yeah. verse 85 well, the, the funny thing is about that, I did that video where I, I explained who Desira was. But prior to that, even just with the first panel where we had Desira featured, which was Skeletor's flashback, yeah, um, people people just started really enjoying Desira, going, oh, I really like this character. And I was like, oh. It's like, it's not, I don't claim ownership of it at all. It's like Robbie London came up with the, the, the character and idea. Uh, Don Manuel did the design, then Doosan gave her that color scheme. And I was like, that's right. gorgeous. 
So it's like those three are the people that technically <laughs> created her. But um, yeah, people, people seem to really dig her character. So I was like, that's great, you know. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. But yeah, like I, I just, um, I really enjoy Marcino Say Five. It's, it's a nice outlet. I don't. Someone said to me, I wish it was official. And I was like, oh my god, yeah, I'd love this to be official. But well, but if it was official, you, yeah, go ahead. You're probably well, gonna say it, it too. No, no, no. <laughs> well, if it was official, you'd have to. There may be certain hoops you'd have to yeah. jump through. You may you may do something. They say, yeah, can you? I mean, I'm sure. You know, I've worked with Mattel over the years. They've always been pretty damn easy to work with. To, yeah. get, to be fair, but um, yeah, they, they may say like, oh, and also instead of T. Lou, we we're thinking about pushing this character in the Origins storyline. So could you make it this character right. instead? I'm like, ah, oh, we don't want to do that. So um, yeah, does that... by doing a fan comic, it's just you have complete control over it. And I'm I'm fingers crossed. Like Mattel don't kick up a fuss anytime soon. I mean, it's, it's not doing huge numbers on social media. I think when it's done, when issue one is complete, more people will look at it. But for the time being, it is just like a little fan comic that's kind of going along and doing quite nicely, as in people seem to really like it. So, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's got to be freeing to just be able to just play in the sandbox without any worries about, you know, who feels what or... Oh no, Desira didn't clear, you know, legal, so now we gotta sub someone else out, stuff like that, yeah. you know. It's, it's that, and the, the problem I, I and it's, it's not me venting at anybody writing for Mattel or any Kevin Smiths or anybody like that, but my, my one problem with Marcy Universe the last 10 years is nobody seems to be able to just write a story. Every story has to be the end of the world story, or let's, let's you know, it's everything we must save the universe story it's like can't we just tell stories like we grew up yes. with and i'm not saying dumb it dumb it down no. it's just like why can't skeletal get an artifact why can't there be new big baddie why can't there be this why can't we have those adventures where there's a start and a finish why does it have to be you know and this isn't this isn't me yeah. having a go at multiverse but why is that a thing why is that now mattel's go-to thing why do you know i i get that you can do more with it but the more you, what people don't seem to understand, well, certain people is, the more you do this, there's this one guy back here called He-Man. Yeah. He's supposed to be the star of your show. Exactly. Not Ula, Wonder, King Grayskull, Hero, Hero 2, diddly diddly diddly. Yep. There's the one guy, the most powerful man in the universe. That's the guy you've got to focus on. I think the, the only thing I think may kind of hold on to that is, um, I get the feeling the Kevin Smith cartoon yeah. will be the thing that says, he man, just because when so. when he did that panel at um at PowerCon last year, and he said when he ju when he just said like film the 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 filmation cartoon was about family, yeah. I was just like, oh my god, this guy gets it. Yes. And like he he hasn't watched a lot of the series, but he watched enough to understand that you've got this core cast of characters, and that's what you that's what you do, you know. And if if someone said, oh, you can't do that, it's like TV shows have gone on for decades with a core cast of characters. Yeah. You can do this. You know, Spider-Man stories, yes, they involve multiverses and stuff like that, but you can still tell Spider-Man stories that have a start and a finish. And I don't see why He-Man now is this... How can we expand the brand? It's like, the way you expand the brand is to get it back here mm. and sell it to people as this. Then you expand. You don't right. sell people on, there's 100 He-Man. It's like, what? On, you know, mm -hmm. how about... There's this one guy called He-Man yeah. and She-Ra, and this is this is the stories, this is the universe, this is the world they in, inhabit. These are the baddies they fight. I don't know why everything is has to be so epic. Yeah, don't... I get that people want to tell stories. Let's kill the sorceress. Let's kill yeah. this character. Let's, how about like let's not kill anybody. No. Let's tell good stories with yeah. stakes and characters. You know, simple as that. Yeah, don't end it right when you're getting it started. Like, why are you gonna do twelve issues that end with the end of the world? You know, it. Uh, you know, and I know Sean's probably tuning out now because I go on this rant usually at least once every three episodes, but I, I feel exactly <laughs> the same way. Uh, you know, you can't you can't just keep and I don't mind deaths in in like care, you know, in, in storylines and stuff, but it's got to be earned. You know, you got to go for a while. You know, if you can if you can lay down a good like three years uh, of a comic run then yeah, feel free to start shaking up the status quo and have the story progress, but it's got to get there naturally. You can't just jump to that, like, issue one, we kill off all the main characters. It's like, well, then yeah. why are we even here? Well, why do we with, do this? That's the thing. With, with Master Universe 85, if this was a, a thing that came out, like, once a month, my goal would be you start off with stories like this, mm -hmm. then you tell a story 
that's big and maybe yeah. you do something that changes something along the way but you don't suddenly make that the the right. status quo and now oh no this is the thing it's it's you you build up to these moments and then you tell standard stories then you tell big stories and then you bring in she and then you yeah. do this and then you go then and, do, and it's th- that's the way i think i would like and and the other thing is you know the the the, the criticism of the comic industry is always in these modern times is you know their attitude is, well, who's going to buy Spider-Man 728 when there's been 727 issues before? And it's like, when I was a kid, I bought yes. Mighty Thor 3... Oh, God, what was it? 334, which I think was around about the when they introduced Beta Ray Bill and all that stuff, when Walt Simonson took over. I loved those, those comics as a kid. But I bought that Thor comic, and I didn't think well, I better buy all the previous Thor comics because you can't do that. But also, it's just you just bought comics because they were good and they sold you on that. I bought Spider-Man, I bought Captain America, I bought Hulk. Right. I bought all these things, these stories that were like 200, 300 issues in. Yeah. And, and the, 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 what that does as well is if you see a comic that's at issue 28, like Master Universe, for example, Master Universe 85, issue 28, yeah. you think, oh my God, there's been 27 others of these. I really it's like this. Good. Let me go and get the others. Not like... Here's six issues. Here's another six issues. Yeah. Here's another six issues. Because all that, like, and that's, you know, I know MV Creations did that, but obviously they were a part, they were becoming, a, they had to right. be a part of the way the comic industry is at that point. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's such a shame. I miss the idea of, like, it's funny to think there'll probably never be a He-Man comic that get, gets up to issue 20 because after 12 issues or six issues, it's like, right, right we need to start up another series. This one's going to be called The War to End All Wars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this one's called Cla- Clash of Champions and other <laughs> WWE titles. It's just like, oh my God, just, you know, it, it's, it boggles the mind. It's like, tell, you know, bring people in by creating and establishing something that's lasting. And I just think that's the problem at the moment. It just seems to be very off the cuff and we'll do this comic and we'll do that and then we'll do this and that. And I want nothing but success for this line. And from what I, like the, I think it was the Eternity War. One of the things I did like about that um, I didn't read it, and that's not me saying it's bad. It's just uh, at this point, like because the the DC relaunch where it was He Man with amnesia, yeah. that that really put me off. I, be, the thing that put me off most was the fact the art changed every issue. It's like, oh, there's Castle Grayskull, mm-hmm. and now it's different. And Beast Man looks like this, but now he looks yep. like this. And there was such, I don't know what the editorial was on that, but it was atrocious. It's like if you can't keep characters consistent art-wise, how can you expect me to invest in it? Well, on that, I but will say, I, I will say on that, I think it was a matter of them correcting because they launched this stuff out there, and, and everyone, the backlash from it was so great that like, wait a minute, we gotta, we gotta pull this back and get it a little bit more recognizable. Um, and they had yeah, a hard oh, time absolutely. keeping people, and it was just a mess there. So. Yeah, that's that's the thing. It's, it's such a shame that. You, you think if you're going to launch something, maybe look at what's already been established. Don't go like, let's make everybody dark and gritty. And da, da, da. Let's just yeah. like see what's been established. You know, again, I keep going on about those Mark Tex era comics. Right. An adult can look at those and go, these are beautiful works of art. Same with the Alcala stuff. You can look at that stuff and go, these are beautiful. It's not like you can't make those these days. So why does everybody have to reintroduce, reinvent and recreate everybody? It's, I don't understand that. But exactly. um <laughs> yeah i just i i i yeah the the thing about the eternity war that i did like was i remember my friend lee in america i was i was visiting him at the time probably for one of the power cons and lee said have you read the eternity war because he reads all of them and i said no and he goes it's, he goes it's okay but he said the um he goes one of the best things they've done is that where skeletor i think looks into every other dimension there's formation new adventures yeah. this that and the other and he see he sees that in every other dimension or sorry every other reality he loses yeah. and i was like oh that's such a good idea that is a great idea for some sort of mm-hmm. leaping off point but i think i think from what i heard that was like near the end of the comic but i love i love the idea of skeletal somehow breaking through to this multiverse and going wow i yeah. lose in every one therefore i've got to do if i want to be victorious i've got to do everything i've got to be the opposite of the, all these other skeletons that was interesting yeah. but again you just have to look no further than the movie for what keeps going wrong it's like <laughs> right we're gonna do a he-man we're gonna do a he-man script right. the, the 50th he-man script and in this one um you know he-man and skeletor uh, skeletor is he-man's uncle it's like oh god not yeah. this 
and then the most you know the, the one they keep going to and it's like i reckon this is i've got a feeling this is what the cgi the, the kid cartoon is going to be <laughs> i reckon he-man and skeletor are going to be brothers oh, I hope not. because for, because for some reason like mattel i don't think it's mattel or someone somewhere is obsessed with the idea and it's like yeah that's a really good idea how about doing a poor man's thor and loki after thor and loki right. has become almost the de facto sibling rivalry it it's ridiculous we've had and it's like you know thor and loki you know i grew up with thor comics so i know about that whole thing before but the marvel mcu films right. made made that relationship or that that uh, thing so prominent that everybody is always going to look at any kind of brotherly rivalry as poor man's thor and loki it's like why make skeletal to me as i've said with marcy universe 85 He's just a demon from another dimension. What are his motives? He's a baddie. He just wants to control the planet. Surely he must be connected to the... No, he's not. <laughs> he's just a bad guy. He's a demon. Like, the clue is in the title, Lord of Destruction. Not Lord of Destruction, who was re who's really pissed off because he didn't get the throne when he was a kid. It's like, come on. Thor did that already so much better. Let's not do it again. And this this movie, I, can, I will always say, I don't think it's ever going to happen. All we get is press... Announcement after press announcement, director after director, writer after. I've met the writers, <laughs> I've met the directors, and it's my, one of my my, uh, my housemate, um, my landlady stroke housemate. Uh, um, she um, recently moved out actually, but her and her boyfriend are, um, I'd say, budding Hollywood writers, but they're actually doing very well for themselves at the moment. And they had a meeting with the guy, one of the guys who was working on. I don't know which guy, and I probably don't want to say any names in case I ruin it, but. <laughs> He was one of the people at one point who was charged with producing or writing the movie or something. Right. And she said she went into his office and on his desk were the Dark Horse books. Nice. And she goes, oh, my, my housemate. She goes, my housemate James mm. Insult works on that. And he was like, oh, cool. And he goes, I've got to say, he goes, this is the hardest project I've ever had to get off the ground. Wow. This is like a Hollywood guy who's done, from what I understand, like a history, t two decades worth of movies and scripts and production and all this and yet he's finding a film about toys hard to make because there's too many cooks yeah. and it, this is the problem it's like they keep they keep wanting to tell the big story it's like just tell a goddamn <laughs> movie it's so it's easy it it's so yeah. easy it's a, you've got you've got all this history just pull yeah. from this tell a story about Taylor. do Taylor's quest but do it on an epic thing oh, do diamond ray but you've got all this all this wonderful stuff, like even, you know, recent things you could probably extract from and pull from, but they just, it has to, you know, they want to do the big movie where they, they basically, it's like DC with their movies. They just want to jump into the big action pack yeah. rather, than, than, rather than establishing, yeah. you know, that, the, the mistake DC, I, I, I really had high hopes for DC and it's just like, okay, you're doing your dark thing, fine, but at least you're building to say, oh no, you're going to no, jump in, you're going to kill Superman straight in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna kill Superman in his second film appearance. Right. That yeah. seems a bit, you know. It, whereas Marvel, we're gonna kill off Iron Man after like 28 right. movies of 10 years, 12, mm -hmm. whatever it was, 11 years of okay. movies. Then we're gonna kill off Iron Man, and it's yeah. and this is the problem. Every uh, I remember, I remember Kevin Smith talking about this a few years ago. He said every company Hasbro. This is before he got hired. Hasbro and Mattel, all these different companies want to create their own universe multi yeah. you know so he said there was talk of hasbro going we're going to make a we're going to make visionaries movies mask movies uh this movie that is like what can't you just focus on one thing and maybe just but yeah anyway i, I feel like i've gone off a massive rant here so oh, we love massive <laughs> rants it's great i feel the same way you, you hit it on the <laughs> head everyone's trying to jump into the deep end right now go ahead sean i well, cut, it, I cut it, you the, off. What they're trying to do is they're trying to put a brand that we're used to seeing in a certain light into the this is the new normal right. when it comes to storytelling and and you know like even with the new Shira uh, Netflix show it had to turn into okay reality is going to end at some point you know and it's like you know at least they built up to that point over a couple. Oh, yeah, yeah. versus here's the story and it's just the end of the universe unless he man could put a stop to it and i agree you know it's like the, the reason we love these characters is we were built up this is who this person is mm -hmm. and the other thing that you said that i i completely agree with because when i was a kid 
you know, you, you jumped into Justice League. Justice League was on issue, you know, like 500, whatever. Or, you know, I, I don't yeah, know, yeah, but, yeah. you know, early 80s. Just, yeah. hey, one-stop shop for all these characters that I love. And I read it, and nine out of ten times I go, that's awesome. Now i got to get the one before right. that, and I want to know the one after that. And there's all this wealth of information you're learning just by the fact you're just trying something. Versus it all has to start with a number one issue every time. And then yeah. it's like, so you have islands. And I, I've said that a couple of times on the show. You have islands that you're jumping back and forth to, but it doesn't add up to a whole. It adds no. up to this miniseries just said this. Just this miniseries, like Thundercats He-Man crossover, but then it leads yeah. to injustice. Where does that lead to? Ah, and then all of a sudden multiverse, and you're like, yeah. are these going to matter after a point? Are these going like, yeah, to actually lead to a is, yeah. bigger sum of its whole? And it's like, no, it's just these islands you're jumping back and forth on, basically. It's, it's such a shame because it's... It... I don't know. It's, I, I Like I say, I'm, I'm so far removed from the brand these days that I can't really comment because it's like, well, I, I can comment as a fan. But, yeah, it's, you know, I know a lot of the people working on these brands and it's um, they're making decisions and it's like, like you got to let them do it. You know, as simple as that. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, Scott Scott Knightley took a lot of flack, but um, I think what he did for Classics was amazing because he, he pushed that line and he... You know, there's a lot of people that worked on that line, obviously, like the Four Horsemen and everybody, but um, he was the brand manager for it. And I think he made some mistakes along the way in terms of, I think, I've said it publicly before, I think Scott's biggest mistake was trying to be friends with the fans. Yeah, I think part that, of it. As, yeah. honestly, I, I, no, honestly, I think as a brand manager, you've got to be quite aloof and distant. Mm -hmm. You've got to have that, you've got to do like the Q&A sessions, but I think the moment you try and be be friends with people as a brand manager i think is the biggest mistake right. because you open yourself up for like not criticism but people think they can interact with you in a certain way um but yeah i mean obviously yeah they, they were errors made with that classics line but i think on the whole when you think about what we got and scott was a large, large part of that um so I, I think you know the guy the guy did the best he could he you know without him we wouldn't have had i don't i don't think one of the best uh, Marcy Universe toy, probably the best Marcy Universe toy line, she wrote Princess Power toy line that we've ever had. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. True. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Master Universe 85. Uh, so, volume, or, so it's still split up into issues. Uh, how many pages per yeah. issue, roughly? Are we like tw the usual 20, 22, or? Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm, just, I'm actually looking at my um, my screen right now. The, cause I, I did I did the layouts for every issue. Um, yeah, if you just want to, if you just want to send is, those over to me and Sean, that's that's yeah. fine too. Uh, pa page page twenty three is the last part. Yeah, so cover and then okay. pages one to twenty three. It's quite funny when I look at this. It's like bloody, hell, we're only on page uh, seven and we're still in the opening scene. I really need to speed this comic up a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Oh no! When you read when you're reading it all through, honestly, it doesn't even just getting the pages once a week feels slow. But when you're reading the pages, like there's nothing slow about this plot, um, and every page just leaves us wanting more and more. So uh, I, I I just can't wait. Um, it's gonna... last thing before we switch over to the review, I guess, and I've always been curious. How'd you come up with Busta Tunes? Is that is that your hip hop uh, a little hip hop influencer? Oh yeah, that was that was totally my hip hop influence because like the so I was big into um, yeah hip hop and like there was this hip hop group called Leaders of the New School and I was so I still am still love their music. They only did like two albums, but one of their one of one of the members was a guy who went on to be very successful, a guy called Busta Rhymes. But back then yeah. he was just the the, the fourth member of this group and i was just like oh i love this guy he's he's just so he's got such charisma and personality in, in the videos and stuff and in interviews he was always quite fascinating so when i became when i got online i was like what should i call myself and i was like buster and i've got a love for cartoons so i'll be buster tunes and then the first ever thing i did online was there was a website god a message board called the dominion and in late 95 someone was talking about the real ghostbusters and i said something like Oh, I really like the episode Ragnar Rock and Roll, and I, I talked about what I knew about the episode. And someone replied saying, "Hey, Buster, Babs here." And I thought, "Oh no, you think I'm Buster Bunny from Tiny Toons?" <laughs> it was. Uh, I was like, "Oh man, I, I need to specify. Look, I know I'm a cool hip hop person with a cartoon surname." 
so yeah, that's that's where that silly name came from. But then it became like I, br- I brought it back for Marcy Universe eighty five. I was like, I think I called it Buster yeah. Tunes Productions or Comics or something. I was like, yeah, I might bring it back because mm-hmm. I could have called it Same As because Same As is the whole production company we used for the Return of Faker. But I thought, no, I'll call this Buster Tunes as a because anybody kind of stumbling online might go, oh, serial geek guy or oh, that guy from back in the day. So yeah, that's that's the hook for that. Very nice work. We can't wait to see more. It's it's an exciting time right now. Um, yeah, so we might as well jump right over to our review for the day. So uh, today we're going to be reviewing Dawn yeah. of Dragoon. This is the 20th episode of the filmation He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. It was written by Robbie Lunding, directed by Ed Freeman... <clears throat> script was approved January 28th of 1983. The final script revision was July 28th of 1983. And the UK air date was March 5th of 1984. Thank you, James, for all that lovely information. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I could help. <laughs> That's an essential part of every episode we've recorded. So, yeah, no. uh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and obviously this this is a favorite episode. Um, I remember it very well from childhood. It was luckily released on VHS. Um, I, I watch it over and over again and you know we'll get into specific scenes, but the, the two scenes in this out of many that they hit me they hit me hard every time I watch it, no matter how old I get. so. Uh, and we'll get to that specifically. But uh, James and Sean, your your first memories of this episode. Up to you, Sean. Uh, uh, real quick, yeah, I, this one is one I remember very well from my childhood. It, it, there's there's definitely two scenes I could think of. Adam, they might be the same as what Matt's talking about, but there's two scenes that stick out that when I was rewatching it today just to refresh myself on it, I was just like, yeah, this is why this episode is held up for me. Uh, and it's it's been in my memory. And uh, it, it's pretty fun. And I'm not the biggest Orko guy, but it is fun to have him uh, be the centerpiece of the episode the way he is. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I always cite this episode as... I remember many years ago, I used to work in the civil service, so UK government. And um, I was I was... We were going for after work... We're in the pub one night drinking, and um, this girl says to me, um, I think this was just when I was getting ready to leave the civil service and quit my day job, as it were, and start doing the Mattel work for the encyclopedia. And she and I said, oh, I'm going to be doing it. She goes, wow, hey, man. And this was what summed it up to me, how good Dawn of Dragoon is. She goes, yeah, the only thing I remember about that, that show is um, she, oh, there was one, she, she named one episode. Oh, yeah, she goes, she goes, there's amazing. She goes, I remember Teela's, she said, Teela's mother was the bird woman. I was like, yeah, the sorceress. And then she goes, I remember the one with Orko's girlfriend. And I was like, yeah, Dawn of Dragoon. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's episodes that almost like transcend the series mm-hmm. where um, it's it's very premise and visuals uh, are just very iconic. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've always loved this episode. And, yeah, it was crazy. It was released on VHS in the UK so many times. It was about four or five times on different releases. But the funny thing was, my, my, my fun my fun anecdote about the VHS tape, I used to go to this video store that was about, uh, I guess, like a five... My dad you know, would get in the car and drive to this VA, uh, video store, and it was about a five-minute drive away. And they had this tape, and it was Life Father, Like Daughter, Creatures from the Tile Swamp, and Dawn of Dragoon. And... I, I would always rent this VHS tape out because I was like, oh, I loved Dawn of Dragoon. And it was, I didn't have it on VHS. So I kept getting it. And then the funniest part was um, many years later when the, when the VHS, when the video store closed, I actually bought that tape from them. So I was like, oh, this is the tape I used to rent. Now I own it. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Sean's got one of those too. I got a couple of those. Uh, the video store, they were selling... Uh, all of their VHS is off at one point and really? they had at least three. And one day it was 1996. I went in there I'll be right back. and I started picking them up. I, I, I picked them up and it, it, I, uh, one of them was uh, the first one I remember on it was Damar the demon. Oh yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I vaguely remembered that one from my childhood, but uh, I remember I had a, uh, my bedroom was 
apart from the house. It was kind of like above the garage oh, yeah, where yeah. I was living. So my parents, they could hear. I had the windows open. It's in the middle of the summer. I had the window open, the fan running. But my mom could still hear, by the power of your soul. <laughs> she came upstairs and she goes, are you reliving your childhood? And she sees it on my TV and I'm playing it. And I just kind of smile at her and she's like, okay. She's like, that's what you spent your paycheck on. I'm like, well, they had a, it was like literally like two ninety nine or something like that to buy these. I'm like, for two ninety nine, of course I'm going to buy these. Why wouldn't I? You know, and no, it's, it's, it's funny, like the VHS thing. I've, I've still got a bunch of VHSs myself, like ones I bought when I was a kid, but also... Now, if if I if I see certain videos, I'm like, yeah, I think I'll buy that because I've, I've still got a VHS player. So it's like, yeah, I'll buy that. So it's a bugger to connect up to an HDMI telly, but or yeah, HD yeah. telly, but you get there in the no, end. I, I, that's actually one rabbit hole I haven't fallen down in recent years. Although I wanted to because those, but here in the U.S., those magic window videos are in the RCA. They use the same, uh, yeah, they sure, use the yeah. same pic, pictures, but those images are so iconic it's like i don't even have a vhs player but i would there's a part of me that would love those just to like set up just to look at i do have i think i have all of them from my childhood the three that i actually had in the in the clamshells so but mm -hmm. oh well yeah because look the problem about trying to buy the cardboard box ones now they're always yeah. scuffed on the corners because oh, obviously yeah. those are yeah just like ah that's the yeah. ones I had, yeah. <laughs> That's great. I do, I do have the stand-up um, that would sit in in the stores, oh, the, the twenty four ninety five. Uh, you know, now available. It's got the Ice Hacker and uh, uh, Shadow Wing and all that on there. I I did get one of those, which is absolutely amazing. Nice. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump on over here, guys. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, so for those of you following along at home, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, you'll be able to see the episode right here with us. Uh, otherwise, go ahead and pull it up on YouTube or your streaming service or pop in those old DVDs. So I'll get the countdown. Three, two, one, and then away we'll go. Three, two, one. You, the the art of introductions is completely lost nowadays. You either just have a flash of a title card, or sometimes nothing at all, even now. And yeah, it's, it's such a shame. Like, I mean, I mean, the the Netflix Shira show did have an intro of sorts, if I remember rightly. Because I, I still I've only still seen season one of that show, but that had an intro. But yeah, it's it's not really encouraged these days, which is such a shame, just because of the way shows a broadcast but um yeah you think back to the 80s and even before that like, the 70s and stuff those shows that would even the 60s with like the spider-man series um those shows would draw you in with their theme songs or visuals and yeah and this is one of the obviously the best because it's just like yep this this really draws you in absolutely I can't not see Orko every time on the intro and remember the what the hell is that moment that I had as a kid because he was not in the mini comics up right. to that point. <laughs> it, it, and it, it's interesting to hear you 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 uh, started with the toys just like I did, James, and then you moved into the cartoon and, and all that. And it's just like I had the same thing. And there were definitely a couple moments here or there watching the cartoon that it was starkly like well, this is different than the way I pictured it or whatever and stuff, but you learn to embrace <laughs> it because it's an everyday thing. It's like, I have to watch this every day because it was, uh, it was important. Oh, but it, it, yeah. it, it is, it is interesting to hear, like we're basically from the same era of this starting out in that way. So yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, there's many of us as it were. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I feel like the old curmudgeon. Oh, this one's the problem. Oh, okay. You know. Right. Well, so the, the, the beautiful thing about this episode, because it was written by Robbie London, and obviously he was the guy that, you know, devised the series, as it were. You know, when people think about how Orko is written initially and Skeletor and all these characters, it's all Robbie London. And he was doing Man at Arms as the Grouch, because you think of Man at Arms in Diamond Ray, where he has a go at Orko for the egg trick and um, a few other Robbie London episodes. He always 
has man at arms as the Kamaji and you know, kind of like very, yeah. very kind of just angry at everything. And Orko is the prankster. But the, the beautiful thing about this episode, I always like, is that Orko. This is this is an example of how you write a decent Orko episode. You don't write him as a child. You write him as um, someone that you know has stakes and an importance. And yeah, he's young, but he's you know he's got this responsibility. And um, yeah, because so many writers would often write him as a as a child, and that's the biggest mistake you can make. Like right. Daymar the Demon is atrocious for the way Orko is written as like a, a little kid. It's like, no, don't write him as a little kid. He's he's a, he's an experienced they, wizard. They you know, are simple still as that. one of the better episodes where they do that, though. I'm just going to say. I'm going to defend him from you a little bit. That is that is a fun episode. <laughs> oh, no, don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a fun episode, and it's like Daymar, and the whole mood of the episode is yeah. really strong. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's like uh, Str- uh, Straczynski as well would write Orko as a mm. bit of a child. And also, like... Um, he would he would often write Orko as the voice of the audience, and it's like yeah, that that's the way you can write Orko sometimes, but sometimes yeah, it's just he's still got to be maddening. competent. He's still got to be a good magician. You know? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He can't be yeah. He can't be absolutely foolish because it just right. falls apart. Uh, Driel was I forgot to say Driel. I think it was designed by Tom Ta- oh, yeah. Tataranowitz because um, and then the funny thing is she's got that um, Arabian vibe the way she's yeah. designed. Because if you look at season two, actually if you look at Driel's return, which is I think episode fifty three or fifty four. Um, Driel has got like she's been redesigned. She's got bigger eyes and more rounded Disney esque yeah. appearance. Whereas in this, she's like I say, she's more Arabian in a presentation, like a um, a belly dancer, right. as it were. You know, has a little. No, I like how they did that. And yeah, these. Yeah, and, and these. Um, I was going to say the the very questionable. Because <laughs> um, the funny thing was, I never I never clocked them. Obviously, Me as a kid. Well, obviously, as a kid, you wouldn't clock that kind of thing. But it wasn't until late years when someone said, "Oh, those um." those like plants or whatever it were, mm-hmm. try to look like phallic symbols or phallic objects. I was like, no, they don't. And then I spoke to one of the people working at, who worked in the backgrounds and was like, yeah, that was, we did that on purpose. Like, oh, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, 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 you drew you, penises. You tried to defend man. them, but yeah, then you find out just, nope, yep. Yeah, and then it's just like, yep. oh, no, you were right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I love, the, the scene coming up is one of my favourite scenes. I would, when I had the VHS tape, uh, when I would rent it out, I watched it over and over again um, to the point where that VHS tape that I now own has got the, it's worn out where Prince Adam and Cringer in front of Castle Grey has gone transparent. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so unique because the camera, the camera doesn't pan up to the sword. It just no, sticks it there and then yeah. he cuts to that and he's transforming. Um, you get a little Cringer in, um, yeah, a little interruption thing. Yeah, but it was, it was always one of my favourite transformations. I watched it so many times to the point where it's like, engraved in my brain and um and then we get to see him obviously lower the jawbridge with you know at this point we hadn't mm-hmm. seen him but no he actually had he he said said Diamond him, um, dame on the demon yeah. yeah of course yeah um but like for me in this one i don't know why it always kind of stuck in my brain this appearance and the- oh, and they were very rarely used um portal room here in castle gray scott never never got enough no well. no I remember here, and I think to save Skeletor jumps to mind as, or seeing a, a room similar. Yeah, because that's when Skeletor, Skeletor's like, oh, that's, oh, yeah, and Skeletor also, in that one, he, Skeletor realizes how He Man lowers yeah. the jawbridge. Where he's like, so that's how he does it. <laughs> that's the one that sticks in my mind. That's how he does it. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a great little moment. It's- I always think, like I've said before, one of, one of my favorite, what they should have done with this scene, which I think would have made it so. It would have made it like maybe silly, but also it would have made sense. Is they enter the portal as He Man and Battle Cat, and obviously emerge as Cringer yeah. and Prince Adam. But I think for comedy value, they should have come out with Adam riding Cringer and Cringer just right. collapsing. Because I think that would have been so that would have been such a better visual to see, you know, um, Adam kind of sat on Cringer going, "What? What right. just happened?" You know, because he should be. Battle Cat was running something. through. Why would Why would He Man have gotten off mid portal? You know. Yeah, and it's but it's 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 a fun. This is like what yeah. I love about this episode. It is very much a nineteen eighties, um, like I, I, dare I say, like kids cartoon right. because it's just oh, it's the backwards episode they had already done in Shazam. I think Paul Dini had done a Shazam episode um, where they couldn't transform into their other selves until they said it until they said the words Shazam right. backwards or Captain Marvel backwards, and so this is just kind of lifted from that whole thing. And um, 
yeah, just I, I love this scene. Like yes. in this, when you see it as a kid, you're like, oh my goodness, he can't can't transform into He Man. That makes mm -hmm. Why can't he? Yeah, he holds up the sword and nothing happens, and it pans that back down and cross across his chest. Like, what? What am I doing wrong here? You know, and uh, the the fire turned into water. Actually, my older sister for uh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, I was no, gonna go. say my older sister. No, no, go, go, she, go, go, go. Wrote, she had to write a short story for one of her classes, and she. She wrote it, uh, uh, described this alien world where waterfalls flowed up and fish flew and, and all that. She completely <laughs> plagiarized from, uh, from this episode. That's how much they were watching it with me as a youngster. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, of course, the, the, veil, the, the kind of thinly veiled reference, well, not thinly veiled reference to Skeletor, but it's like, oh, wow, Skeletor's a part of this episode. Right. We didn't even know it because... You know, Drago was working for him, and obviously the connection is when when Robbie London wrote Diamond Red Disappearance, when it was called The Lost Stone of Souls, the episode. It was, um, yeah, that's when the the villains were consisted of Beastman, Merman, Triclops, Desira, Octus, yeah. and Dragoon. So Dragoon is a carryover from that original kind of um, original version of what Robbie London had envisioned the evil masters of the right. universe to be. Hmm. So it's interesting that because he doesn't need to be connected to Skeletor, but it you know when when you kind of put it so oh that kind of makes sense and it sets up uh, the episode where Whiplash goes to Trolla later on like okay this is a plan Skeletor is not too worried about but he's he is sometimes thinking like maybe I should try to take over that planet once in a while yeah take over <laughs> Trolla yeah now uh, you brought it up there Octus has that character ever been revealed or did he turn into another character no 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 there's just there was just like some dialogue in the uh, Lost Stone of Souls okay. script, and it's just like Octus is this. I think Dusan did an amazing design, which I don't think he's ever shared, which I, I should get him to share at some point because it was it was really gorgeous. I was like, wow, that's so good. Um, so I might, um, yeah, I should, or I should try and include it in Marcy Universe Eighty Five in some way. It's all like, another flashback, but then it becomes slightly self indulgent. He, 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 it's like remember that time me you me you and Octus. <laughs> He can, he can be the, your Calyx. You can put him in there just to, like, blast him to bits. You know, he can be your cannon fodder. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I love this as a kid. All the all the Trollins imprisoned in that giant fortress. It was great. Yeah, it's funny. In the storyboards, like, the um, dragon was a very yes. different design. Um, and also, which, which I think if you look at the moment when... He first appears and he looms over them. You just see a shadow. His shadow is actually the original design, where it's kind of like more dragony yeah. in appearance. Obviously, he I'll is a dragon, but I'll show yeah, it again um, when I get a little bigger. But yeah, that uh, it really reminds me of it. Oh yeah, there yeah, it, it is. really reminds me more of um. Oh, what was the younger dragon's name in Return of Granamir? Oh yeah, oh. that's who, that's who it reminds me of in design. Just looking a bit more evil. It's it's very similar. Yeah, evil tall. He's, he's just sucking all the power right out of the Trollins. I mean, that's... Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was really well done, this episode. Like, and then, yeah, you don't you don't show it as blood. You show it as, like, right. sand. Cool. <laughs> so technically, he's ripping out their souls, but, you know, it's just like, oh, some pretty pretty <laughs> little sand glimmering in a jar. Nothing to worry about, kids. But I, 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 was, I just... What I love about this episode is it doesn't let oh. up. It's it's quite. It never slows down to be talky or preach or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's just Adam arrives on Troller and then it's just here we go, one scene to the next to the next. It's like I say, it's a very, in a way, it's a very simple story. But I think that's its brilliance is that it manages to cram so much into a short space of time. Like it's, I think this is an episode you could show to right. anybody. An instant nostalgia will flood over them, it's, especially when you get to, you know, Adam. Uh, you yes. saying the phrase backwards in order to transform because it's like oh that's so beautiful it's it's so um, of its time but also it's quite innocent and it's it's a part of what made the series so wonderful and like yeah this the scene it's oh, just yeah. oh my god when again one of those things I watched over and over again as a kid what I love about it is just Adam's realization the moment he realizes what he has to do it's just such yeah. a it's filmation stock, but his eyes widen. He's like, that's it. And you're like, oh, my God. 
this and is about the threat to of this um, because in the script this gator dog yeah. or whatever it is here like i think it's called it's called an alligator, alligator. lion in the model sheet but yeah the um what, just the, the moment he realizes i just love the wide-eyed expression yeah. and it's a, it's as the you know it's breaking and it's like Yeah, I like how you. It, it's a, it's such a simple <laughs> fix, but it blew your mind as a kid. I this is one of the scenes I oh, was yeah, talking yeah. about. Like when he finally goes, it's backwards. You're like, duh. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. Even in the final script, it's written as it's written yes. phonetically backwards. So originally they were gonna like because the Shazam <laughs> episode that I previously mentioned, they did it where they they said it phonetically backwards. They just yeah, didn't well, say. That's... You know, obviously they didn't say Marvel like Captain Marvel. They didn't say Marvel Captain backwards. They actually pronounced the word Shazam and Captain Marvel right. backwards. So in the script, it's like I think it's written as like Luke Skier. You know, but it's like oh, that would not have worked. It's so much better that he says it just right. the words backwards because again, keeping it simple. And now the the confidence. He's like, all right, I'm He Man now. I got this. Let's do. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now I can name call again. Um, but yeah, the dragon such a he's such a great design. It's like that is a character that should have made more oh, than absolutely. one appearance. And I know, I know I know they reused the model for um, yep. the dark one in the she episode into the dark dimension. But he's such a amazing yeah. looking villain. That's actually w and of course like one of the one uh, of the complaints I have, and I know it's getting ahead of it, but I don't like the dragoon turn at the end there. You know, I like. I no, like He Man saving him and everything, but then I think Dragoon should have just been yeah. the usual, you know, well, that was dumb and take off, you know, like, I wouldn't have saved you type of yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, I. Yes, it's exactly. Yeah, I, I, I like the. It's, like I said, this episode is very nostalgic and very, very almost like very innocent. So I think it works right. in that sense, but it just seems like such a sudden change of like, I wouldn't have saved you. And then he was like, well, I'm going to preach to you. And Dragoon's like, Oh well, okay. Yeah, I right. think you convinced me. So like, what? <laughs> that, that convinced me. And because, um, but yeah, I think I it think, robs you of a great villain. Yeah. Like you said, I would love yeah. to see Dragoon be a recurring villain. You know. I think the problem is, is I think I've told. Well, I've, I've read it in the book. Is that originally this episode didn't feature this scene? Originally, Dragoon charges at Battle uh, yep. Hey Man and Battleco, I think, and then falls into the abyss himself. So he, he never threw this mm -hmm. boulder, and basically, Dragoon. Like basically jumps and falls into right. the abyss forever and like dies technically, and um, that you know implied that Dragoon was going to fall forever and He Man yeah. was kind of like quite happy about that. Um, <laughs> but I think what what they did because they were obviously creating this very you know right. moral guided character is that they overcorrected. So like not only we're we going to save Dragoon, right. but we're going to make it's him a good guy it. at the end. And it's like. Oh, really? I, th I feel like yeah. you've, you've, you've oversteered. You exactly. know, kind of that you're into ice. So we're in ice, we're in ice, quick, oversteer. And kind of, I'm not saying the episode is a disaster, of course not. No. It's a classic, but yeah, it's, I, um, the, dragoon, the dragoon solution is far too yeah, flowery. I love this scene. He Man's really struggling to pull him up, you know, really it, sliding down there and everything. It, it gives you the character of He Man perfectly. Like, he doesn't want to see any life taken. A shot of him busting. No, it's, uh, this, yeah, this episode is, yeah, it's this scene kind of does stay with you. You know, I wouldn't have saved you. And he's like, that's, you know, that's how we're different. I believe in saving lives. That, uh, you know, I may be your enemy, yep. but you're not mine. That's, wow, that's, that's an amazing piece of dialogue right there. <laughs> they should have done a follow-up episode where Dragoon didn't right. see sense, and He-Man goes, "I told you, I told you, I'd be back." And like, Ch -ch -ch, I told you, I'd be that back. Was, there you go, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I thought about He-Man. I I tried to be good for a while there, but you know, whatever. That that's too hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a yeah. bit boring, frankly. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> the scene here with Orko just just looking just down just there's nothing i can do he thinks i just met this girl she's awesome and now she's comatose you know yeah it's pretty pretty harsh that's what you say it doesn't let up well, i mean at all. 
No, it's, it's, it's one scene into the next. It really is. There's no like, oh, now we're going to get some expositional scene. It's like, no, no, no. Now we're getting the next scene. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the final resolution with, um, you know, Orko showing his face to Driel. Again, it's one of those moments. I, I, back on my blog, God, about 10 years ago, I did like the top 30 moments from the film. Yeah. I, I think this was like, like in the oh, top easily. five because it is amazing. It's, it, it's an incredible scene. It's, it's, you could look at it and go, well, it's a cartoon and it's one little weird character showing his face to another weird character. But it's like, yeah, but do you understand the the depth and complexity that goes into just what they're right. saying? It's it's you know, it's a declaration of love, it's this, that and the other. But it's it's adorable, it's wonderful, and of course, we don't get to see Orko. No. It's just like, oh no. You think you think you're going to for a second there and then you oh, just you really see the don't. shadow. <laughs> but honestly that makes it more memorable that you're like because it it keeps up the mystery, but it still progresses his story. And it's showing how much the writers took this stuff seriously that they they created these worlds, they created these rules, and they stick with them. You know, whereas a lot of shows, especially for kids, they, they play fast and loose with the rules here and there and everything, you know. But they, they got this whole backstory for Orko, and they follow through with it bit for bit here, you know. I love that animation. Even his hat curls up a little bit there when he sees yeah, it. Yeah, his hat curls up, yeah. <laughs> I like Drill's little fawning thing she does at the end. <laughs> but yeah, this is um, the, like the race against time thing. There was, a, there was, I think in the story, because obviously I own the original storyboard to this, so there's like pages of deleted material. And because um, the, the the fight between him and Dragoon was long, but I think there's a longer scene here between Man Arms and the Sorceress when they're looking out the window. Because yeah, you see that shot of the moon. It's like, how are they looking at the moon? It's actually from Grey Skull's time. Yeah, yeah. And this, this, this line was always weird. That I guess this means we've been eating our vegetables. It's like, I presume that means because you grew yeah. big. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, what? It's so weird. I'm sure that was put in upon advice of that uh, doctor that reviewed all yeah, the episodes. Probably, yeah. it's like, oh, you mm, can get a mm. vegetable reference in here. <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. Yeah, Donald, Donald, was it Donald Roberts did this? The, did the He-Man says he was probably like, yeah, you need to put a vegetable reference in at least one every one plus <laughs> episode. But I, I, it's, it's funny, um, I talked about how this was released on VHS in the UK so many times, but with the US, the UK releases, they would often trim them down, so oh. some of the VHS releases didn't have the moral segments, mm -hmm. so we, we, I never saw this moral until probably the 90s, so it was really weird. This is actually the, the same, that image of He-Man there is the one they used for the 1-900 number. Um... That was, yeah, that was the yep. video. Yeah, they used, and the one of Orko hugging He-Man as well, or like about yeah, to hug yeah. He-Man. With the, with, the, with the terrible Orko voice, he's like, hey, He-Man, this is me talking. <laughs> like, oh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> that advert was, because, you know, I talked about when I got the VHS from America, I think I did, and, uh, yeah, my, fr my friend, when he put the episodes on, because they were the USA Network episodes, right. um, they had all those 1-800 numbers or whatever yeah. adverts, and, my God, those were... Quite terrifying, mm -hmm. but yes, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the best episodes in the series easily. Um, Dawn of Dragoon, I've always oh, thought absolutely. so. There's a reason. There's a reason it resonates with so many people it's because it's unforgettable. And it, and like I said, it transcends the series where you can talk to a stranger about him and they're like, "Oh, you yeah, remember like the female Orko one?" It's like, "Yes, yeah, absolutely." And it's you know, and real quick here because we're always talking by the time it comes. But even the end, end yeah. credits are just so striking. It's just that shot of Grayskull at night, and the theme music kicks in. And, you know, it, the end of every show pumps those kids up just as much as the beginning of every show. You know, credits roll, and you're just like, yeah, let's go fight evil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, these days, obviously, the way credits, the way TV shows, you know, credits are like yeah. tiny little boxes if, they, if it's on broadcast. Or like Netflix even says, hey, you know, the credits are starting. Do you want to skip the entire set of credits? It's like, oh, man, really? Or like the official He-Man YouTube channel. Yes. Now, to my knowledge, they, are, they, they upload episodes with no intro and no outro. It's just but, title, like, I think, title card and, yeah. Yeah, title episode. card for the it's beginning, like, and then on. at the end, it's that... Oft reused shot of He-Man oh, holding yeah, yeah. a sword that's used on all merchandise since like 2002 on, uh, with like a weird colored yeah, background. So, yeah, where he's, he's got brown pants and a red cross. Yeah. He's like they're the same color. That's the whole point. <laughs> it's just <laughs> yeah, bizarre. 
but yeah, this this episode has resonated since I was a kid. Like I said, those those the the scene of Orko showing his face and the scene of uh, well, I count them both as one. The scene where Adam realizes he can't transform and where he realizes how to transform. Those are your moments of the episode. It's got it's got a great guest villain um, that I wish we'd seen more of. I wish we got a classics figure of him. Uh, yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so, so James, uh, your closing thoughts here, and then we will review on a scale of one to ten. One being, why did you guys make me watch that? And ten being <laughs> utter and pure perfection. Oh, uh, just my closing thoughts yeah, on the yeah, episode. Yeah, um, yeah just it's easily one of the best. Like I said, it's just, uh, I think, you know, sometimes I think people just take it for granted that it exists, but it's such an important episode because it establishes that Orko is more than just the the court magician, um, like you said, killer villain, but also Robbie London makes a script in which even Skeletor is tied into this story about seeing him go, go, Dragoon, go and cause havoc. You don't need to right. see that. You know he's established that so that that's that's what great writing is where it makes you go wow what was that all about when did that meeting take place so you know that Skeletor and dragon have been involved in some way at some right. point and yeah you know that they're there and i think the, the, the only downside about the episode is like you know i'm such a fan of Taylor. It's like she's pretty much written out of the episode but then how do you write her into an episode where you're dealing with adam's secret identity you can't right. really do that it becomes very problematic if you Oh no! You know, suddenly I know. I know He-Man would often show up in the most absurd of circumstances with Taylor, but, um, but it, yeah, have, no, I, I he'd have it's... no way out of that one. It's like Adam comes out of the other side of the portal. No. Uh, yeah, He-Man had to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mid midway through the portal, He-Man tagged me. Yeah, it's like the hot, the hot, the hot tag, and then I was in. You know, it's like, yeah. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, I, I rate it on a scale of one to ten. What did I say in the book? I'm going to guess I said either eight or nine. Yeah, it probably was one of those. I want, I want your, uh, you give your ranking today, I, and I, then I, I'll give you your ranking gonna, from then. Oh, okay. I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to say a nine. Okay, so, so time has been favorable because you only did an eight when you wrote <laughs> the book. I just did an eight. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I guess because I because I've just I'm freshly watched it. I guess that's the the that's reason. Part of it. But yeah, it's definitely like I say, it's definitely up there. Yeah, you actually don't, and even in your review, you have no, you have no real negatives there. Usually, you'll you'll kind of explain where where the points taken away was, but that one's all glowing, um, and a lot of the stuff. Here. Yeah, I, I think, like I say, I think the, the 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 only reason I probably gave it an eight is, um, like I say, because it's it is, I know this isn't a detriment. It is like a very kid centric sure. episode like you can watch this as a kid and really appreciate it. you watch it as an adult you get that nostalgia feel it's not like something like the problem with power is just or yeah. into the abyss as such especially into the abyss into this such a character yep. piece you you wouldn't watch that as a kid and actually i tell a lot i enjoyed it as a kid but yeah. maybe for the big epic ending right um but yeah it's it's uh i think dawn of is one of those episodes that you know, I think when we're all dead and buried and stuff, and maybe this series is in the archives somewhere, or like people are going, "What's that old cartoon?" That'll be one of the episodes that people look at because it's like, "Oh, this is this is a fun cartoon." Look, there's yeah. fun little wizards and backwards stuff. It's, yeah. I think that's where the the joy. It's it's a very joyful episode. It's, it's just go. a good adventure. It's a good fun adventure, beginning to end. Um, there's no end of the world yeah, stuff. Exactly. You know? There's no. There's no. <laughs> We need eight different versions of Orko, otherwise this story doesn't work. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Sean. Uh, I'll give it... I'll do an eight. Um, and the, I like... Um, the backward transformation sequence always yes. stuck out for me. There's no way around that, because it's very rare when they would change that up to that extent. Mm -hmm. And it was just fun to actually hear, you know, the actual backwards way... And then all of a sudden you get the energy coming out of the sword. And as a kid, it's like, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're rooting for him even harder in that one for that reason. Uh, I like that Adam is similar to how he is in the secret of the sword. When he shows up on Trala, he's just, he's, he's all like, let's just get the yep. mission going. And, you know, it's not, it's not the, you know, he's all business. Would, yeah. Yeah. He's all business. He's, he's running right into danger to try to help Orko and everything, which is great. Uh, Dragoon's one of the most awesomely designed filmation villains, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it's that whole, like you were saying, Matt, that turn at the yeah. end. I really 
such that they wouldn't have had, well, maybe it's better if I help people. It's like, no, make him a son of a bitch. Make him that <laughs> yeah. guy. Because he's draining life force right. up until that point. And then yeah. all of a sudden, maybe it's better to help people. Uh-huh, sure, you know. Like, and, and you know, it would have been maybe even more interesting for him to be like, may have him go, maybe I should do that. And then at the end, nah. And then he throws He-Man into the pit or right. something and turn it into <laughs> mess, But that would have made it more um, and, uh, and I actually really love how a character like Orko is used to show responsibility yes. because th uh, that whole thing, like the minute Driel shows up and it's the whole, I'm going to help her. And, and everybody's like, well, we got to come after you. No, this is my responsibility. I got to see this through. And I really like how they showcase that in that character in particular, because like you guys were saying back and forth, they, they could paint him childish or they could paint him as. He's an experienced wizard, and this I feel like is a good in between. In between, yeah, absolutely. That. And it's it's a great example of like if you don't like Orko, this is an episode you can watch and go, but you can see why people care about him. You can see why people love him, and he's been endearing all these years in that way. So, for me in particular, like I was never a huge Orko guy, but watching this, it's like you're rooting for the guy the entire time. Man. Absolutely, yeah. And, so yeah, I. I Appreciate that side of him quite a and lot. And that's it. It's th this is Orko to me right here. Like, yes, he he can goof around. He can have a good time. He can act, you know, he can act playful. But when the chips are down, when it's time to do what needs to be done, he's right there at the front lines. He's giving it his all. Uh, you see that confidence boost, you know, and you, you got to yeah. feel sympathy for Orko too. I mean, he's been trapped on Eternia for many years now. At a depleted power level, his magic doesn't work right. He goes from being Orko the Great to just, you know, an average magician that's unreliable. And, you know, that takes a toll on you, too. And now him able to go back to Trala and be in his element, everything's working like it should. He gets that boost like, hey, I remember now who who I was, you know. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, and that's great to see. It's great to see him confident. It's great to see him get the girl. Like, I mean, he's... <laughs> he, you know, he saves her. He saves his people. And but then at the end of the day, he's like, you know what? But he, but he man needs me. You know, I, I, I know Troll is gonna be okay. We can come back and help when it needs to be. Um, but really, Eternia, that's where the conflict is. That's where I need to be. And he makes that. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's 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 really the end of a story arc for Orko. Because going from creatures in the tar swamp, which I'm sure was aired after this. Uh, mm. to, uh, to, uh, to here returning to his homeland and choosing to come this time, you know, and it, it just shows the mm -hmm. growth of where he's at and his, his importance in it. Um, and for that reason, I got to go with James on this one. I got to go nine out of 10. The only thing that's keeping this from a 10 for me is Dragoon's turn at the end. If he had stayed evil, this, I would have given it a 10. So, um, and if he would have showed up again, it would have been a great intro to a villain. That would have been a yeah. welcome. Come on back Absolutely. anytime. You know, like, this is great. This is good stuff. And honestly, so. I know, James, you touched on it while we were reviewing, but, yeah, the, the Lu Luke Sarg foe rewap et yib. I... <laughs> Oh, yeah, if they, it, it I wouldn't don't have worked think, as well. I mean, I understand why they did that, but yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I don't think it would have been ha as memorable if he had done that as opposed to Grayskull of Power the Buy. Like I've been able to say that ever since I was a kid, yeah. and, you know, because it it <laughs> sticks with you. I don't think the phonetic would have in that same way. So I'm glad they changed that at the last no. minute. Probably because honestly, yeah. probably because John Irwin got in the recording studio and was like, "You want me to say what?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. I ain't doing that. <laughs> uh, real quick here too, in your in your trivia yeah. section here, uh, you said that this episode was originally going to be used in the direct video, the greatest adventures of all. Um, oh, yeah. And then we know from a lost episode that Song of Solis was also supposed to be used in the greatest adventures of all. So, was yeah. Basically, I think what happened... So, Robbie London, I think, obviously was... You know, like I say, he's one of the earliest writers of the show. He wrote Diamond Drive Disappearance. He wrote the pilot, and he wrote a lot of the establishing material. Um, at least in the way... Because, obviously, Michael Halperin wrote the series Bible, and then Robbie London wrote the Filmation series Bible, as it were, which right. took Halperin's work and turned it into something else. 
um, not much deviation, but just you know, Orco becomes well, sorry, Gorpo right. becomes Orco, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so Robbie London, I, I'm guessing, I think I'm pretty sure was tasked with writing a um, like a director yeah. movie version, which obviously they aired at the, the Man's Chinese Theatre, and um, yeah, he uh, he wrote obviously he wrote Diamond Road Experience. So obviously he just included two more of his scripts, so Dawn of Dragoon and well, Song of Song Solace, of Solace. Wasn't his. and then eventually. Oh, that's Jay Bryn Steen and Michael yes, Reeves together. Yep. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I don't know at what point that they they changed matters, but I, I really loved the the three episodes they used on that no, special because it was you had the ridiculous Diamond Ray action packed yep. introducing everybody. Then you had the the character piece with Tila's Quest, and then the ludicrously action packed back and yes. forth, back and forth, Colossal Awakes. It was just like wow, that's a that's a great. Uh, I think Dawn of Dragoon would have been a welcome addition to that if that had been in place of Colossal. But regardless, it's um, yeah, so it's, it's so, just a the... what if. The funny thing was actually yeah, just but... so I just remembered when we were in the warehouse, the Formation Warehouse back in I want to say like 2005. Lee and I were going through all this material and we found. Do you remember the greatest adventure of all when <clears throat> when the sorceress is talking at the end and she goes, the you know. Here we like you see yeah. images from other episodes. There's like oh, it was... the mass. You see the mass of power. You see Evelyn's plot. You see a random shot he... of the attack track he and the shot of cat, right? dra- dragon invasion. Yeah. Oh no, no, you're thinking of the end of Teela's quest. Yeah. Like, this is this is the very oh, yeah, end of the yeah, episode yeah, right. when she's saying, as you can see, there are many, there are many more adventures. So it's like yeah, dragon invasion, random attack track. Um, Evelyn's plot and Masks um, of Power. Well, the other one I mentioned. Was I know because that power. drove me nuts because I never but got that... to see Masks of Power as a kid, and I always wondered what that episode was. Oh, right. It was the same type of thing. It was a tease. It's... Well, the, the weird thing was when we were in the warehouse, we saw a large pan, and I wish, I wish we could remember what it was, but it had four different other episodes really? on there. So it was obviously like, what? yeah, there was four. So there was the pan of. The, what we saw in the episode, but there was another pan with four different window images, and I wish I could remember what they were, but it's just like, this is different to what we saw. So, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. God knows where that is. So I guess that days. was my, my, my main question. So D- Diamond Ray was always on The Greatest Adventures of All, right? There wasn't three completely different ones? Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, absolutely. Diamond Ray would, would have always been there because it was the pilot, so they really wanted to introduce that, that whole... You know, here's the cast of heroes and yeah. villains that you're probably going to see for the, the next Except few years. Jitsu so, yeah. Or Trapper or whatever you want to call him. Trapper, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Poor old Jitsu. Yeah, no. Th- uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for all the great work you've done with this. Um, there, There is one complaint, though, I have. And since I got you in person... Yeah, go for it. Uh, the one complaint I have about this guide... No index. no index. Yes, it has. Was that ever discussed? Yeah. Was it ever thought about? Because I always have to look. If I'm looking for a specific it's episode, I always have to look it up online first, so I get the episode number and then flip to it. And that's the one thing since I got it. I'm like, what in yeah, the world? It, <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know what happened. That all I know is when we were putting the book together, um, the guys at Dark Horse said, "This is your page count." It was a proper like meticulous thing. This is the funny thing. So. You know, there's the page with the Reign of the Monster storyboards, and then there's the page with the um, Orco yeah. reveal. So you've got those acetate pages. They could only be on select pages. So, like, the guys at Dark Horse said, here's your page count. Um, here's the pages where you can include a special feature. So I had to make sure that the pages right. worked. That's the best way to put it. And when we got to the towards the end of the book with, like, some spare pages, it was a choice between doing the index or putting in stuff like The Greatest Adventure of All, Secret of the Sword, wow. um, uh, The Christmas Special. So it was a case of, we take that stuff out or do we put an index in? It's like, we got, you know, we kind of got to yeah. go with content I over made the index. Same. I would have made the same decision yeah, putting every, it that way, said, okay. Because like, <laughs> everybody, everybody always says, like, when they got the unofficial book, it's like, the unofficial book is great because it's got this kick-ass index. So you can look at Paul Dini and then go through all the Paul Dini pages not just these episodes, but any time I've mentioned him and the same with characters like Dragoon and this, that, and the other. And the official book doesn't have an index. It's like, I, oh, I should maybe just print off an index. I, I should do that. 
I'm going to write that down. Well, I did Print not know that your unofficial book had that, so now I know when we get off here, I'm going to head to He-Man Shira shop and go get a there copy of the unofficial guide because last, well, last time I was on there, yeah, it is the still available. Is so. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, I've got still many, many copies of that book left. But the, obviously, that index does not pertain to the index of the official book. No, but, I, but I can find the episode but, um, numbers, yeah, if you're looking for and then I can go look, text up, look it up that yeah, way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, very easy. I think, if I remember rightly, yeah. Just looking where I've got a copy of the book. Oh, they're all, they're all <laughs> in the bags. But, yeah, you can, yeah, you can... Um, yeah, you look at the index. I think they've got the episode titles in there, directors, writers, whatever. Nice. And it's just like, pfft. I should, I should do like an index for the official book. Actually, I might, I might think about doing that. Hopefully, I won't get sued <laughs> for doing that. But I think, I think there's, I think I can get away. You with just that. give it to us, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll put it out there. That way, we get sued for a change. We can, we can yeah, put there the lawsuits go. around there. <laughs> oh, all right, yeah. Sean, you got anything uh, you want to cover before we wrap up? Nope, I'm pretty good. I actually got to hit, hit the road here in a minute because I can hear little feet running around without them being <laughs> supervised because my wife is gone at the moment. James. So it's time for me to James, sign off. James, you got anything? <laughs> oh, no, thanks for having me on, guys. It's been a, a lot of fun. Um, yeah, let's let's do it again oh, at man. some point, as they say. Maybe when I've finished issue one or something of Mars University 85 because then you can do it and we can talk about oh, what well, happened. Definitely. Yeah, yeah issue well, one. pencil them in, yeah. Sean. He's our, he takes yeah. care of all our schedule. Oh, yeah. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. It's that time then. Uh, we want to thank James Etock for joining us. We want to thank all you uh, viewers at home for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Do us a favor. Uh, I got a bunch of links down below. Uh, go order that bundle book. Go visit James's He-Man she shop. I'll get a link down to that below. Buy some Serial Geek. We're so busy with everything else, we never got to talk about Serial Geek. That is... Uh, see, we got to have you on many, many more times. Uh, there's still copies there of Serial go. Geek available. Yeah. There's copies of, of his unofficial guide, the second printing. Uh, I got some cool, like, model sheet type uh, things off of there. Uh, check that out. Uh, we'll see if we can we can link to some of Deucin's work that you brought up. And... Uh, uh while you're down there you might as well click that like button uh subscribe to us that would be great leave a comment down below uh let us know what you think about what we're doing and uh thanks again so uh until next time guys <laughs> until next time